welcome in everybody this is the let's talk piercing podcast uh right now it's just a live chat and the way this is going to work here in the future is if you're subscribed you can come into the live chat and you can ask questions and be part of the community if you're not subscribed you can still come in and watch but we highly encourage the subscription now on this podcast well first of all my name is scott wilkinson i'm a professional piercer and on this podcast here we're going to be talking all kinds of piercing related content there's going to be questions we're going to talk about jewelry who knows what is going to be brought up on this show um and on the other side of the microphone here we do have nova so uh, say hi nova hey everybody how are you <laughs> So, yeah, uh, we're going to be taking questions here today. We're going to be going for about two hours. So if you have a question, make sure you ask a really good, thorough question, and I'll do my best of my ability to answer that for you. And, of course, we always love seeing where everyone's from. So uh, when we do our shout-outs, make sure you let us know who you are and where you're from. So how's your uh, week been going, Nova? My week has been great. It has been quite relaxing, actually. Awesome, awesome. Uh, we've got Kaylee here from the UK. Hi, Kaylee. Hey, Kaylee. Welcome in. But uh, but yeah, I had a good weekend. Um, I am I downsized my bridge last week, uh, which I'm pretty stoked about. I did, and uh, it looks really good. Thank you. Yeah, and my my high nostrils are the are are getting close to being able to be downsized. <laughs> so, which I'm very excited about. I I put a lot of effort into keeping those. Uh, all right, we've got all kinds of people now. I have been seeing those bumps kind of drop down there. So, and everyone, welcome in. We're gonna start this off right cheers i got my dutch brothers today i don't know what you guys are drinking if you're drinking your coffee water alcohol beer whatever it may be cheers to you all right who do we got in here uh let's see we've got uh we've got gent pickle uh hello robin from alabama um we've got uh i'm gonna try with this name uh kirschen hello from good old germany hey, uh chip douglas hey how you how are you what's up chip how you doing buddy <laughs> uh jesse c hi jesse from california uh, torn and dismembered says, "Hey, <laughs> mm, torn and dismembered. Wow, that's, uh, that's, that's a tough one. That's a um, name, yeah." Snapdragon D four twenty. Hello, what? Scott from Oregon. Hey, Snapdragon, how you doing? Uh, Swamp ass, what up, Scott Nova? <laughs> Our man, Swamp yeah. ass. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse C with the cold brew, love it. What's up, Jesse? Lots All of friendly right. faces here. Good, good. Always glad to have everyone here. Um, and you know what? We're going to start off with a really cool question. Yes. Now, normally, I don't answer questions in the chat down below, but I mean, you guys are more than welcome to talk about things. And if you do have a question, I mean, like if it's good enough, I'll start off the show with it. And that's what we're going to do today. Um, there was a question we I wanted to start off with. Who was this? And what is the question, Nova? Um, again, um, forgive me with the name. I'm going to do my best. Okay. Uh, it looks like Niaja Marie. Okay. Uh, or Mary. Um, hi, so sorry I missed you. Uh, I have 15 ear piercings. Over the last year, I have been dead stretching my lobes. I've been using glass plugs, and since getting them to 6 gauge, I've been moving up 0.5 millimeter a stretch. Good job. Uh, I'm now at 7.5 millimeters, and am excited for the next stretch, as I believe 8 millimeters is the equivalent to 0 gauge. Uh, my original lobe piercings were done when I was 10 years old, 56 years ago. Wow, that's awesome. Yes. Uh, with a piercing gun by my doctor dad, and over the years, uh, I've sometimes allowed the piercings to close and re-pierce them myself. I know, shame on me. <laughs> uh, I was not gentle when I did the re-piercings, uh, and there was sometimes bleeding. Um, okay, here's my question. Ever since I've started stretching, I've noticed that the inside of the fistula isn't smooth in some places. There are a couple places that look like the teeth of a gear. Yes. Um, gear, G-E-A-R. Uh, the skin is healthy, and there isn't any swelling or blowout. Um, if I gently stretch the fistula with my fingers, the teeth grooves smooth out. Uh, did I cause these quote-unquote teeth when I re-pierced, uh, and they're the remnants of old tears? Uh, I use bio-oil when I massage my lobes as I prepare for each stretch. Is there something else that I might uh, that I can use that might help lessen, uh, lessen them, or am I pretty much stuck with them as is? Uh, they're not causing any compromise in the lobe. I still have a healthy amount of lobe all over the fistula. Uh, thank you so much for the help. Oh, the right lobe has three ear piercings, the stretch lobe, and the other two are 14-gauge double conch, two forward helix. Left ear has stretch lobe, two sets of stacked lobes, a total of four conch, or four piercings, a conch piercing, a forward helix, and a rook. Wow, that's awesome. It's quite the setup. That's yes. really, really amazing. Okay, so now as far as those stretched ears go, um, a lot of people look at this as a negative thing, and this is totally a natural thing. Uh, like I said in the comments, you're going to be totally fine, and this does happen. Now, the thing is, is when we take a piercing out, a lot of times 
the hole can stay open for quite a while, but what it does is it shrinks and goes back to its natural state. Because when we do piercing, we don't remove tissue, just like with stretch shears, that whole thing wasn't punched out. But when you take the jewelry out and there's no pressure holding it back out, it wants to go back in. Now, and the thing is, is it's kind of like a rubber band, your earlobe, it's, it's kind of like more like a dead rubber band where it's like it stretches a little bit, but it didn't start always that big. It started smaller and you go a little bigger and a little bigger and then it naturally has those folds in there. Now the thing is, is the bigger you go, the more, I'm gonna say the less you're gonna see some of those folds. A lot of times it doesn't shrink up as much, but at the sizes you're at around the zero, the double zero gauge, um, a lot of times it does shrink up like that and kind of looks, Honestly, kind of like a butt. It kind of sucks, but that's what happens. So that's why we keep jewelry in there. And the longer you have it, the more stretched out it's going to seem. But you'll always have a little bit of that shrinkage and a little bit of the wrinkles in there. Absolutely nothing you did. Um, unfortunately, the way to get rid of it, or I'm not saying the way to get rid of it, is people who stretch way too fast create scar tissue. And that scar tissue isn't going to wrinkle up the same way as normal healthy tissue. So it's actually a really good sign. And if you did have all that scar tissue, yeah, it's not going to shrink upon you, but you're not going to be able to stretch the same way because it's all scar tissue and not natural stretching tissue. I love this question. I'm glad I got to answer it for you. Um, if anyone else has opinions, de definitely let us know in the comments. All right. Yeah, it's a good a, one. Yes, yes. Fantastic questions. Thanks for asking. Absolutely. Um, we've got a bunch of people and a bunch of new questions. All right. Um, so let's see. I'm going to start with, uh, let's see. I think we left off on Serenity. Uh, it's from Barbados. Hi, uh, shout out from Barbados. Barbados, awesome. Love it. Uh, Katie, hello from Texas. Uh, hey, Katie. We've got Claire from Exeter, England. Hey, Claire. Awesome. Uh, and Sammy, who is getting a new piercing in a couple weeks, apparently she's torn between a libre, a vertical libre, and snake bites. Ooh, that's a tough call. I mean, all of them have such a different look. I mean, when it comes down to it for me, for oral piercings, I'm always a fan of the ones that are outside of the mouth, so that vertical libret is going to be my favorite one. But, you know, you just can't substitute that for the snake bites. Snake bites are so rad. Same thing with the normal libret, because you can wear the ring through the libret, but you can't wear it through the vertical Ah, decisions, decisions. Good luck to you. Uh, we have a message from Kelsey. Uh, she dropped in. Hi, everyone. Hope you're having a great day. Today is fully booked day for me here at the shop. Woo. Yay. Uh, don't hey, forget Kelsey. to hit that like and subscribe. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kelsey. Hope you have a wonderful day. Yep. Kelsey will be on every, uh, will be on next week. Yep. So. Uh, we have to mark her off on the schedule to get her here. So, but yeah, yes, we, we love do. having her here. So we try to do it at least every other week or so if we can. So. Yeah, it's a fun one. She got booked out so quick last week. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jacob, uh, let's see. Uh, Y'all have any advice on nipple piercings and HRT? So it'd be hormone replacement therapy. Um, I don't. Uh, because once you start changing things, the size and everything's going to change, and I don't know what's going to exactly happen to the initial piercing. I, you're going to be able to get it and heal the piercing, but if something's growing or shrinking, depending on which type of hormone you're on, it, it could change the angle or the shape. I don't have a lot of experience in how that does affect things. I don't have an answer for you, but I'm going to look into it. Um, if you guys have any uh, any information, let us know in the comments. Do you have any information on that, Nova? Do you know? Um, I, I do not. Yeah, I... I generally i i would think the same that it, that it might that it may change but no i don't know the answer to that shouldn't either. change a lot but i would say if anything the angles should change but you still should be able to heal the piercing up no problem awesome yep uh yeah jacob we'll we'll double check on that for you you know what the one thing i would say is if you're gonna get your nipples pierced and um and your nipples are gonna be growing the piercing's probably gonna be towards the tip of the nipple and that the piercing's gonna look too far out would be my only big concern because it's not like the nipple's going to grow and the piercing stays there. The nipple goes with that tissue. So that would be the only thing. And uh, I don't know, just talk to your doctor about it. Just make sure it's safe during that during that time. It should be totally fine. Though. Yep. Yeah. Uh, hi, V. Big fan. Hey, uh, hello. <laughs> uh, let's see. I always try to say hi and then say low. It's a hi, low. <laughs> hi, low. <laughs> hi, low. That works. Okay. Um, from Lexi. Uh, I'm wanting an ear tattoo and a conch piercing on the same ear. Would you do the conch or the tattoo first? Tattoo first. Yeah, always. Yes, yes. You have to have that tattoo healed. There's no way you could really, you could heal it, but it's going to get so upset it's going to close and then you got to re-pierce it on top of it and then you're dealing with what? Yeah, just 
tattoo it first, then do. I'm curious, what do you want? That would be cool. Conch that's tattooed and then pierced. I actually really, I kind of want that really badly now. Yeah, that sounds <laughs> awesome. I've always wanted to get my ears tattooed. Yeah, same. Yeah, same. They're rad. Uh, from Serenity, uh, I got my navel pierced a couple months ago. It's healing well, uh, but the area around it has been so ashy, uh, and I can't oil or put lotion on it. Any suggestions aside from uh, scrubbing at it to clear it up? Um, I'm wondering if you're using the wound wash spray. Because if you're using the wound wash, you shouldn't get too ashy in that area. Some people who do sea salt soaks mix their salt way too strong, and that will definitely dry your skin out. So... Use the wound wash if you're not using that already. Um, you can lotion around the area, but try not to get the lotion inside. And you'd want to use some sort of a fragrance-free lotion if that is the case. Um, and I don't know how far you want to get away. Probably like uh, no closer than like five to seven millimeters or quarter inch or so away from the piercing. Um, and listen to your body. If it stings, burns, or hurts, you need to back away even further. But yeah, sometimes during season changes and things like that, um, during certain seasons. The skin just gets extra dry, and when you have a fresh piercing, the area is swollen, and that's kind of, in essence, like a sunburn or a windburn where it kind of kills that top layer of skin, which is why we're getting that ashiness to us. So, um, But, yeah, lotion, um, yeah, it should get better, though. Good question. Absolutely. We've got a couple good questions today. Uh, from Clive, uh, hi, I have horizontal barbell nipple piercings. Can I have rings as well? You have horizontal nipple piercings, which is the side to side. Yep. Um, I'm wondering if you can wear a ring. Yeah. The only thing is, is you want to make sure you're completely done with the crusties before you put those rings in there because the barbells generally stay put and they don't move back and forth. So you won't pull those crusties inside. Rings move. And if you pull those crusties inside, it's like pulling a file through. And uh, it's not very comfortable, to be honest with you. You can imagine what pulling a file through a nipple would be like. <laughs> um, the general rule of thumb with choosing a size is you want to have two-thirds of the ring showing and about one-third inside. Um, a lot of people want to have just this tight little ring just barely cupping, and a lot of times that's over half the ring inside. That's way too much curve going through your piercing, which has been done straight. So that's why we say a minimum of one-third of the ring so there's not as much curve going through that straight piercing. Otherwise, it'll change the angle, you'll get bumps, and it just won't be happy. And the other thing, too, is like if you put too small of a ring in there, the ring stays in one position, and you're not able to flip it up or down. There needs to be enough straight where the ring can move back and forth. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, we'll keep it going with Lily. Uh, hi, I'm here from the UK. Uh, I have two piercings on each ear. I have my septum pierced and both nostrils pierced, uh, medusa, tongue, and belly. Sweet. Awesome. That's like Yeah, you're racking life. them up. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, it's so cool how the last decade or so we've been really focusing on, like, the nose, medusa, upper lip area, and it's just, like, this whole central area, which I think is, is pretty cool because it just forces people to look right at the center of your face, you know, so it allows us to engage in conversation because a lot of us get stuck in social media stuff, so we don't want to make eye contact when we're talking, and this just forces it, like, hey, it's true. Right <laughs> in, so. so rad, but cool setup. Right, look right at my nose. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Pirelli, live stream 69, good number. <laughs> <laughs> we were to say that earlier. Yeah, Scott, I'm yeah. thinking of a number between uh, between 1 and 100. <laughs> 69, 69, dude! <laughs> know the reference? Said, let us know in the comments. God, that's a great movie. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. It's one of my favorite movie quotes of all time. Same here. Strange Same. things are afoot at the Circle K. At the Circle K, K. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. From Gent Pickle, uh, I have 20 millimeter lobes. I love the name, by the way. Very cool. Uh, a 12 gauge septum, 10 gauge navel, and vertical labrae. Uh, I did them all myself, other than my navel, and all have turned out well. So that's good. Um, that we, isn't that isn't. We don't typically. ever condone home piercings. Get them done properly. Yeah, they can heal, but I bet they probably could be straighter. And the thing is, is you don't have the proper implements to not introduce bad metals to your body, where you could get. In, uh, allergic reactions to metals um and then it's just knowing the size and placement is everything for things to heal i'm glad things worked out for you but most of the time odds are not in your favor so don't do it at home yeah they um there's there's something that i like to talk about called survivorship bias um and basically the the idea is that like once you go if you go through something that some people consider dangerous and it doesn't go badly um you're like oh well this must not be dangerous uh but just because just because you do it once or that many times that it went well, which is great, um, doesn't mean that it always will go well. 
uh, and and it just takes one bad time to like ruin the rest of your life. Uh, you'd be surprised what 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 I've pulled out of people or what I've seen pulled out of people um, that had had been doing piercings for a significant amount of time. Exactly. Once you have a disease, you have a disease. Once you have that allergy to the metal, you have that allergy to the metal. And it's like, oh, it's not like I just can wear can't wear a you know. It's not like I can't wear cheap jewelry. You know, it's but snaps on your jeans, belt buckles, the snaps going down button down shirts. Um, any metal that would touch your body, a rivet is going to cause a rash and you break out in blisters. And that's not something anyone wants. And that's all from like, oh, see, I just did an eyebrow piercing, you know, save myself a couple dollars. Mm -hmm. For the rest of your life, you're dealing with that kind of stuff. That's why we it's don't true. condone it. So I'm glad you're okay. I am. But don't do home piercings. Yep. Uh, they also ask, uh, or they said that they had great success using grapeseed oil for stretching. Uh, do you know of anyone else who has stretched with this? I've... Her, uh, I've heard of it using for jewelry, but I don't know about well for stretching. Um, are you familiar with grapeseed? Is that a very... Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> I mean, grapeseed isn't a great oil at all. Um, Is it I, tacky? It's, there's, there are a lot of people that are very anti-seed oil, because um, grapeseed oil is actually made... So there's there's a really long story, but it doesn't it, it it's like it's it's not it's not a man it's a man made thing like there is there's no such thing as a grape seed, um, it's there's just seed grapes, kind kind of but yeah um, I I don't like it for anything personally, but for stretching it's probably fun. Really, any oil works for stretching. What what do you mean by there is no real grape seed? So grape seed um originally way back in the day um they were making. Um, I can't remember which company it was, but they were making like animal fat, uh, to put in soap and stuff like that. Uh huh. Um, and eventually they started using, um, using a bunch of other chemicals and stuff that were, um, replicating. They were like industrial solvents essentially. Okay. Uh, that, that were, that they managed to hire a chemist to make sure that it wasn't dangerous to the skin. Um, and eventually, uh, that's, that's what grapeseed oil and like Crisco became, um, is like they, they, they found a chemist who's like, okay, we, we figured out a way to make this edible. Um, and now we're going to call it like vegetable oil and grapeseed oil and that sort of thing. So it's not like there isn't like a grapeseed plant that they went and got oil from. It's like a man-made thing. Interesting. Because I was thinking like when I'm eating grapes, you have regular seeded grapes and seedless grapes and yeah, there's no oil in those grapes though um so interesting. yeah interesting yep so i i i always prefer just like tea tree oil like stuff that you stuff that exists in out in the out in nature but it doesn't really matter that much i guess i'm gonna say i'm not a fan of tea tree oil because that's supposed to be diluted 100 to 1 with water to be safe for the skin and no one uses it properly sure yeah i, I wasn't saying you should yes. use it to uh use it to heal piercings or anything water-based lubricant for stretching is the best thing you can use i think yeah yep for sure yep uh, Swamp Ass, uh, do you know of any recommendations for piercers in Miami or Fort Lauderdale? I do, but I can't remember who's where. Give me one second to double check. Yeah, I don't remember off the top of my head. I know I know people from Florida just because of the APP conference, and we talk to people. I remember always talking to people from Florida, but I'm just drawing blanks right now. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Me too. Florida, I know I have a couple of friends in, uh, I have a couple of friends in Florida. Cool. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Uh, cheers to you for all of you who are drinking with us. Um, and uh, yeah, just so you know, we're gonna be eventually going to the point where we only do subscribers only for the chat. So make sure you subscribe so you can chat in the future. We only have a couple more of these sessions where everyone can make comments, but we're gonna really start focusing on just the subscribers only. So make sure you're hitting subscribe. It doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't hurt you. You just hit the button. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I know Shorty. Uh, is in he he's in West Palm Beach, but I think that's not super close. Um, I'm trying to find a good. Yeah, here in the I United think... States, sometimes these states are so huge and some are really small. I know, like Texas is bigger than a lot of European countries, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So. Um, I'm pretty sure Sweet Leaf is good, actually. Sweet Leaf. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I uh, I'm I know I don't cool I don't know them personally, song. but I know of uh two of the people <laughs> that work there, and they're good. Uh, yeah, awesome name. <laughs> we love it. Uh, cool. All right. Uh, from Jesse, uh, I recently got my first piercings at 30 years old, low piercings, uh, and advice on how to avoid the cheese wire effect, especially with dangle earrings. Yes, yes. 
Um, the thing is, oh, hey Nova, can you look in that little square box right behind the the computer? And is there those little sticky things? I just ordered them from Amazon. It's behind the other computer, the laptop. There's a little stand. Is there a little box? A little? I thought I might have set them in there. No. No. Okay. I was looking for them. Anyways, I ordered these little sticky things. Um, I wish I could remember. Can you try to look them up on there, like uh? ear savers or like little sticky for stretched ears um but anyways it's a little clear sticker you can put on the front and you can put a heavy earring that's nice and thin and it prevents it from cutting down and it's the sticker basically holds it in place so it doesn't have that cheese cutter effect the other thing is just to wear a thick enough earring uh the ear lift one is what i'm talking about it's an invisible ear lift because you put a sticker on the front you have these right here and it comes with a pack of a bunch of stickers um, and it just prevents that cheese cutter effect. You see how it like has the, the before and after there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you put these on the back of the ear. That's why it's invisible, and it's like a clear little uh, sticker is what it is. They don't show a picture of the sticker at all, do they? I, I thought yeah. I thought... Oh, there's I, some right there, the 20 sheets. Is it? Does it look like that? No, those are the silicone discs that stop the bumps. See the lobe one right next to it? Yeah. Go to the fourth one over from Walmart. Yeah, like that one. Just go right to the website. I think these are how it is. Yeah, see if there's any stickers on there. Yeah, you can almost see it in that picture right there. How there's a little sticker. Is it on the front or am I seeing things? I, th I think they're all photoshopped. Yeah, okay. But anyways, this is something you can use if you have really heavy earrings that are nice and thin. Otherwise, upgrade to thicker posts. Um, mm -hmm. what? Sorry, Nova. Can you also t go into the Google sure. and type in niobium? french hooks now these are higher quality metals niobium is what we, a lot of our captive bead rings are made out of and these can be anodized if you wanted to and a lot of times people will buy these things here you see they're not too expensive and this is a high quality metal and a lot of times they come in different thicknesses and you're going to be able to find a thicker one and you'll be able to upgrade your earrings for these um and basically can you scroll down is anyone wearing any of them in there because it shows but yeah see like the little loop on the bottom you just hook your earring in there yeah, that's not quite a good example of French hook. Yeah, we're trying to find pictures, and we're just kind of failing here. <laughs> um, but anyways, you can order these online, and this is going to give you a thicker post instead of wearing, you know, a real thin wire going through your ear. So, yeah. I've also had people um, that have had luck with, um, like, silicone tunnels. Uh, you, can, you can get them in, like, I don't know, 14 gauge or 12 gauge or something like that. Uh, and then you can just put the post of the earring through the silicone tunnel. Oh, that's a great idea. I'll have to do a video on that. I'll order some of those silicone tunnels and show how we can thicken those things up and prevent further because then you yep. can slide them on the different posts and make everything thick enough. Yeah, and you just you just leave them in all the time. Yeah, that's And if it has the flare on the front, you just can cut that with the scissors. That's awesome. I didn't know anything about that. Yeah. We're all learning here today. <laughs> yeah, Coyote taught me that one. So, that's a good one. Um well, from Monica for the shop, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah uh hi scott and nova uh I, I hope i got your name right if not sorry you did i appreciate it <laughs> um from let's see die die d-i-3-z-n i don't know about the dizen dizen die right. season <laughs> uh what's the best way to get rid of a, a piercing bump it's been bugging me and i'm unsure how to get rid of it fast uh i need a more thorough question um, piercing bumps are generally irritation bumps, which means, um, if you have your nose pierced, you might've caught it on a towel or a shirt and it got pulled on. Um, if you have a nostril L in there and the jewelry keeps coming out that all that irritation is going to cause the bump. If it's on your ear and you're wearing helmets or you're sleeping on that side, hair products get in there. If it's your belly button and you're wearing high-waisted pants, all these things are irritants, which are going to cause the barrier scar tissue to try to protect the piercing. Once the irritation stops, stops happening, a lot of times the bump just goes away on its own. The only other thing I could really say is maybe try some emu oil on it. Um, emu oil can help calm down upset piercing. There was a one-time irritation. Um, a lot of times it just takes time before the bump goes away. If it's constantly irritated, the bump won't go away. Yep. Um, that's the best answer I can give to you. Uh, good luck to you. And uh, Oh, and then there's also the possibility the jewelry is the wrong size, either way too long or way too short or a bad material. There's Absolutely. A lot, of factors, a lot of factors. And keep in mind that it might not be fast. Um, irritation bumps can take a fair amount of time to go down. I, um, 
I got my high nostrils pierced around Christmas and uh, got sick right after. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, and I have irritation bumps that are finally going, that are finally like on their way down. Um, I was just telling Scott, I'm about ready to, about ready to downsize. So it can take a fair amount of time. Just be patient. <laughs> um, Patience is the key. Yes. In, yes, indeed. Uh, from iShow, uh, do you recommend a longer post uh, for Tragus to have some space to clean or a post that's just long enough? You have to have enough room for the swelling. Um, so uh, there's a point where it's too long and there's a point where it's too short. Um, but all the Traguses generally swell, so I always give a little bit of extra room for that. You don't need it necessarily for the cleaning because you're not moving jewelry back and forth. You're just allowing room so it has room to breathe a little bit. So keep that in mind. Don't move it back and forth. Just make sure you have enough room for the swelling. And then once you get pierced like that, uh, during the first week, if you keep the swelling down as much as possible, it does seem to heal a little bit quicker because there's the irritation goes away a lot quicker. So, Yep. Awesome. Uh, a comment from Silently Judging You. Uh, they mentioned that Lynn uh, did a video on HRT and nipple piercings. Um, okay, cool. So yeah, there we go. Check that out. Uh, thanks for the heads up. Uh, Absolutely. Let's see. Uh, Linda, hi from Germany. What are the difficulties of an industrial piercing? Ooh, <laughs> Which one? <laughs> yes. It's a very, very complicated piercing. Um, I'll run over a bunch of stuff. First yes. of all, there's the anatomy. You have to have the right anatomy. Um, sometimes the middle of the ear. Here we go. I got ears right next to me. Um, in a situation like this anatomy, there's no ridge right here, so therefore it's not going to probably heal unless you bent the angle, bent, uh, bent the jewelry a little bit. In an ear like this, you can see how there's way more of a ridge on both sides, and that's going to work much better. But sometimes this inner part that I'm touching right here, this sticks out further than the actual ridges on the ends, and that can cause problems as well. Then there's the whole uh, not bumping it or hitting on things, not sleeping on it, not letting hair product get in there. Um, helmets, headbands, um, those are all issues. Jewelry being way too long or too short are an issue. Uh, aftercare is an issue because you need to clean it once to maybe twice a day with some sort of a wound wash to keep the crusties off there. Uh, what am I missing, Nova? Did I? Yeah, I, I, I think that's pretty much it. Just and going you know, to a quality pier should yep. make sure it's pierced properly. Making sure it's done right is the, is the biggest part, biggest piece of the puzzle. It's not something that's going to be healed in a month. That's physically impossible. I would say a minimum of six months under perfect circumstances, yep. but expect a year. Yep. Yep. Agreed. Uh, from Doggy Loser One, <laughs> I love Loser I love one. these names. They get me every time. Uh, I'm getting a tattoo soon. Uh, my first one. How should I prepare? Much love from Oklahoma. Well, preparing for a tattoo is like preparing for a piercing. Number one, you should have a good night's rest or sleep before you actually go in. Once, if I found myself like not getting a good night's sleep, it, it doesn't go as smooth. Um, the night before, if you have some sort of a pasta or you kind of carve out, it's kind of a natural pain reliever. It gives you the energy and allows you to be sit through your, your tattoo or piercing a little bit better. Eating a nice big meal before you actually go in as well is also something. A lot of people are like, oh, I'm so scared. I'm going to throw up. I can't have food in my system. You need the fuel. You need fuel. So eat some food before you go in. No drugs or alcohol. They make the situation worse. A lot of times drugs are going to be enhancing everything. It's, you know, like, oh, it makes me all chill and relax. I'm like, everything's sensory overload. So things get way worse if you're high. And when you're drunk, maybe a little less painful, but you're more prone to bleeding, more prone to passing out. Um, and you need to sign a legal consent form and we need you sober for that. So, um, yeah. Just good night's sleep. And if you need to, if you need to bring a friend and they allow you to, bring a good support team. Don't bring someone who's going to, like, freak you out or, you know, like, oh, my God, is that real? are they supposed to be bleeding that much? Is this normal? That's the wrong person to bring. You just bring someone you're going to have a normal conversation because the more relaxed you are, the easier it's going to go for you. Yeah, I think that's good. I think you got it all. Good question. Agreed. Good question. Yeah. Uh, from Chip, uh, what's your suggested limit on healing piercings? I got two piercings about two months ago and want to get a few more sometime soon. They are addicting, Chip. Is this Chip Douglas? Yes, indeed. Right on. All right, Chip. Um, generally, I don't like to have more than like three to five piercings healing at once, sometimes like four to five. Uh, the thing is, is your immune system can only handle so much before it starts slowing down the healing process. 
Um, and something also to keep in mind, if you're just healing four earlobes, those are tip earlobes are going to be like healed up in probably month and a half, two months, you know, and you're good to go for the rest of them. But if you're trying to heal up four cartilage piercings, those could be six months to a year before you're completely healed up. So kind of depends. Also, it's not just piercings. If you had an operation and you're trying to heal a broken bone, um, if you are diabetic and you're a slow healer, I would say maybe lessen up on the number of piercings you're healing up. Uh, the location, you know, if everything's all in one, easier to heal it up instead of one here, one here, a nipple and a navel where everything's spread out into your whole body. And same thing with tattoos. You know, it's like, if you have one tattoo and you sat for like five or six hours, that's a lot to heal and getting a piercing isn't going to help your situation. So it's true. Yeah. It's kind of situational, but, and if you're really worried about something like that, zinc supplements is the key. Um, I've been told if I remember right. 60 milligrams for female 120 for male and that's kind of like in a uh steroids for your immune system it just boosts it up there and allows you to heal things faster and a little bit better i think those are the numbers i don't remember exactly it's somewhere around there but i know when you look at multivitamins that's kind of how they regulate things too so cool yeah, yeah i didn't know that um a high from ruru 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 <laughs> yep hi ruru <laughs> that's a fun one to say yeah it is it sounds like Scooby-Doo. Uh, let's see from Snoopy the Crocodile. Uh, hi, love your channel. I'd love to buy new jewelry for my nipple piercing. I was thinking about circular barbells, uh, but I don't know what size I should buy. Normally, I wear 16 millimeter, uh, which I double checked is about is uh, five eighths. So if your barbell is five eighths of an inch, and you're wearing um, and that there's no extra bar showing, the rings you're gonna have to wear are gonna be have to be really really big which means they're going to have to be probably one inch or bigger, probably inch and a quarter, which is a pretty big ring. That means your nipple piercing was either pierced pretty deep or you have the larger nipples. Um, but yeah, generally two thirds of the ring showing and one third in. Let me see if I can try to draw this. Yep. Generally speaking, I would also for this recommend going to a high quality piercer to get sized. Give me just one second. I'll show you how this all works here. Okay, so this is my drawing. I've had this drawing before. Which way do I need to hold it? There we go. So you can see how the lines on the outside here are divided in thirds. So if your nipple was pierced and you're wearing a 5 eighths, say if this bar is 5 eighths of an inch long, you need to have two thirds showing. So that means the ring size is going to probably have to be from here to here is the same distance as from here to here. It's supposed to be. I'm guessing on the drawing if you can. Do, yeah. But that's the general rule of thumb. So um, if you're wearing a 5 ace, you probably need, uh, yeah, inch or bigger. But if you're wearing that 5 ace and you have just a little bit of room on each side, you need to measure from the, the distance of the actual piercing to piercing. And if that's only a half inch, then you're going to want to wear maybe a, five eighths to a three quarter inch ring, you know? So kind of depends on how much actual skin is pierced, not the actual barbell size. Yep. Good question. Sizing jewelry and Nova's X, absolutely right. If you go to a piercer, we're going to be able to find the right size and what's on the works best for you because it's really hard to do that. And then uh, hopefully you're fully healed up so you can actually wear that ring. No more crusties. No yep. More definitely crusties. make sure you're totally healed up um, before putting any new jewelry in. Yes. <laughs> Uh, from Patient Zero. Uh, hey, Scott. Greetings from Arizona. I recently got my tragus in, re-pierced my eyebrow. Congratulations to our neighbor. We're here in Las Vegas and uh, just uh, south of us. Or it depends on where in Arizona you are because it could be to the the, the west of us, I think. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm not really bad at it. <laughs> but anyways, welcome. Glad you're here. Yeah, it's funny. I've been here like almost two years and I actually have no idea like what what state's border nevada <laughs> yeah we're like new york and washington and hawaii i think <laughs> yeah definitely yeah right <laughs> <laughs> not true at all i'm just kidding um let's see we've got another question for or a question from pirelli uh i got a double helix from kelsey last november uh and within the last month the area has started to itch uh, i think they're healing well just itchy any ideas why could it be the recent weather we have yes uh, i plan on having <laughs> On, ha on coming in to have them checked and hopefully replace the jewelry on May 1st. For sure, for sure. Um, 
big weather changes and things really, really affect piercings. Um, my piercings have been acting up. My plants at my shop have been acting up. There's so many things, and it's just weather changes has a huge, huge factor. So the big question for me is, or for me to you, is going to be like, do you have the right size jewelry at this point? Did you downsize? Do you need a shorter bar? Um, is the bar too short now? Is uh, did you just sleep on it really good? Or you know, I know recently I've been sleeping with my window open again because it's starting to warm up a little bit here. Um, and I've been sleeping so much harder that actually my piercings have been acting up because I'm sleeping so hard now. I'm not waking up. So yeah there you go a lot of a lot of little factors but yeah it's got to figure out is it too long or too short yeah make the appointment come on in we'd love to see it we'd love to talk to you absolutely yep. and uh you can probably hear by the way that i'm talking that my allergies are an absolute wreck right now um <laughs> a so, little bit yeah. not a ton you sound pretty good though Nova. oh thank you yeah <laughs> i'm very stuffy um from sammy uh i want to get some stone plugs for my lobes are there stone materials that aren't safe to wear Sorry if this is a silly question, but I figure it's better to ask since I'm not sure. Definitely not a silly question. Um, yeah, I wouldn't um, wear any uranium. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> um, there's probably a couple stone plugs. Uh, oh, God, let me see. So back in the day, when we used to pierce navels, we used to pierce with rings. And the only way we could fancy up a ring back in the day, because it was all steel, you couldn't even color it, was to add a different color stone. We'd go to a bead store and buy the different stones. And if I remember right, sedimentary stones started causing bumps and weird issues. Like we didn't pierce with fresh with lapis, tiger's eye, or a couple other things because if it's an open wound, it caused a really weird growth called the brain on the navel, which is... A more moist area, but I mean, the back of your ear can be just as moist as a navel piercing, so you'd have to be careful about that. But but the thing is, is the stretched ear is fully healed, so you shouldn't have any problems. But I wouldn't be surprised if there was someone out there who had an allergy to that type of stone because it's minerals, and minerals are used for vitamins, right? Are are they ever? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, minerals and vitamins. So so. Theoretically, you could have an allergy. Now, in general, the bigger issue with stone plugs is the polish as opposed to the material. A lot of times a bad polish is going to be very porous, and that's going to rough up your ears and not make them very happy. But a good polished stone, I've never had any problems with, nor have I ever seen. But like I said, it's not impossible. Any opinions on that? Um, yeah, I would say I if they make it in like to wear in the ear it's probably fine um i would just make sure that it's not 100 percent safe safe statement because i know a lot of people make crazy wood stuff that is not safe to that wear. is that's fair um as far as stone jewelry goes, stone though, jewelry you're probably okay though yeah um as far as stone i would just make sure that whatever piece you're getting is high quality and there aren't any uh nicks or cuts or edges or anything along those lines yeah I will say the only thing I've really seen a major amount of problems with was femal clay back in the day. You know, that molded stuff and you can bake it and it gets real hard. And I used to make plugs out of it back in the day because we didn't know, know any better. And the chemicals in there did cause a lot of problems. So don't make femal clay plugs. I know like a lot of the tribes used real clay, but I think clay is good for your skin. From the I'm getting real deep here. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. But in yeah. general, stone plugs are fine. It's just make sure you have they're polished and it's the right size. Some have real small flares. Some have real big ones, different wearing surfaces. Um, and then the only other factor would be weight. If you're really large plugs, sometimes the weight can really make them fall out. And you might need to have hollow plugs at that point. Good question. I don't know how you guys keep coming up with all these crazy <laughs> questions. They're not crazy. It's crazy that I don't hear them and they're not repeated every week. Yeah, That's true. the most impressive part. Right? Yeah. Uh, we've got another one from Lily. Uh, hi, I've had my Medusa pierced for a little over a month. Uh, some days it feels fine and healed, and other days it hurts. Okay. Um, piercings, especially oral piercings, can be kind of problematic. I think sometimes with the foods we eat, because sometimes it can get like acidic stuff and kind of create it more raw on the inside. Um, also, if maybe you're... It could be like if you were to wear some sort of a lipstick or chapstick and or plumper and your lips got bigger and the disc had to get pulled in further, that's going to create some irritation. Um, 
and sometimes just playing with it. I know like back in the day when I had my lip piercings, I used to play with them all the time. And some days they just got sore because I realized I'm just like playing with them and you don't even know you're doing it. So there's a lot of little factors. Piercings can act up. Just uh, try to be nice to your piercings. And the better, more accurately sized jewelry you're wearing, the less chance you are at having problems. Great answer. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we have one from Rebecca B. Uh, I've had my navel pierced for five years, and I still sometimes get irritation bumps from high-waisted pants. Uh, would I get less bumps if I switch to a floating navel? No. um, It's a big misconception for floating navels. You can't just, it's not like you can switch back and forth between a regular pierced navel and a floating navel because they're completely pierced at different angles. Um, And I'm going to go back to the drawing board here. Let me see if I can do this right here. Okay. Now there's two different types of navels. Normally, a lot of people are going to have a ridge where you can pierce, and then you have the bigger ball on the bottom. It's like this is the navel here. Some people have a very round navel just because of the way it's shaped off. And if we try to do that curved barbell like that, there's just not enough skin, and it's going to reject right out. So a floating navel does a completely different approach where it goes in like so, generally a little bit deeper, and you put a flat disc way on the inside so that way you have at least one gem and there's enough tissue to pierce. If you have a ridge, you naturally have that tissue to pierce, but without a ridge, we have to bring that piece way deeper in to get enough tissue to heal, and therefore you only see this. But as you can see, this one's at this angle, and this one's more at that angle so you can't just switch back and forth you might be able to change to a different piece of jewelry maybe a smaller disc or a bead on the inside but it's not going to change it to the floating navel and you just need to be aware of the clothes and pants you're wearing high-waisted pants are always going to cause irritation no matter what you're wearing in there if it's rubbing up against it it's true i would also ask what uh what gauge you were pierced at um i may be sizing up to a slightly larger gauge or a slightly thicker it's not a bad idea uh, add some stability um and if there is movement it might just not be not be quite as bad that's a really really good point yeah sizing up a little bit sometimes can ta- cause a little less of that cheese cutter effect which is the irritation which is causing the bump mm-hmm. yeah it's tough good point thanks Noah. <laughs> absolutely uh we've got a question i'm gonna do my best with this name again uh it looks like anand um how do i know when you were going to go live uh do you have a schedule that you go by or do you post it somewhere <laughs> We're bad about that. Yeah, we are. We are kind of bad about that. We we shoot for um we shoot for roughly every every Wednesday at eleven. Um, but yeah, I'll go ahead. Well, sometimes we do it at noon. Sometimes we do it at eleven. Um, I I think we we should probably start doing it at eleven instead of just like the, the two different times. Um, back in the I was planning on doing it twice a month. Um, we'll figure out a schedule. That's what we're going to do. We're going to figure out a schedule for you. Thank you for pointing this out because the regular time is nice to know. So, um, and maybe we can figure out some sort of a notification. We'll send something out, uh, at least an hour beforehand. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. So we'll try to send something out an hour beforehand from now on. And we're going to probably do at least two a month. It's just, we can't tell you which ones at this point, but we'll figure a schedule. It's going to be probably every other week. We're not sure when we're starting that right now. I'm just having fun with this. We're going to do it every week until I'm, Absolutely, yeah. Schedule we're, announced. We're uh, we're we're going to be leaning into the live stream, Scott. If you want to talk talk about that again, real quick. Yeah. So with our live streams here, we're going to turn this into like a little podcast. And if you are subscribed, basically you're going to be able to participate in the chats here. And then basically it's not going to be uploaded anymore. And it's going to I'm basically going to edit it out. I'm going to add all the, the questions. I don't know if you saw the last week's one, but like I edited it out. We kind of cleaned things up. We did some color correction. Um, we're just trying to give you a more of a quality thing to watch. And I'm planning on mapping those things out so you can see all the questions and that way it can be searched. So if you have like a problem, you can like, hey, why does my bump on my nipple piercing because of da 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 And like, oh, it might come right to this specific uh, podcast and we'll be able to find that and I'll be able to answer it for you. So it's going to be more searchable and you'll be able to find your questions if you want to show someone like, hey, check it out. I was on the live stream and your name's going to pop up and it's going to be fun. So, um, and then we're also going to do uh subscription memberships too, where you're going to be able to 
you know, add some color to your name, things like that, if you want to support the channel. And hopefully that will be up in the next day or two. Um, that's definitely coming real soon. And we'll have a couple different uh, tiers. And yeah, so be looking out for that. And make sure you're subscribed. It's the most important thing. If you're not subscribed, you're not going to be able to ask questions in the future. And then you'll also get the notifications if you hit that little bell too. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, we have an awesome question from patient zero, uh, All one right. that I can personally speak to actually. Cool. Uh, I've had my nipples pierced twice and each time I remove them by choice. Uh, now I want to do it again. Will there be a risk of projection after re-piercing? I believe they meant to say scar tissue. Uh, thanks to you and Nova. Um, Scott actually just re-pierced my nipple for the third time. Uh, and it was the easiest, the easiest of the three. Um, and yeah, don't think there will be any, any risk, uh, any additional risk for rejection correct the only general risk for rejection is if you had it rejected before and then it's more prone to the second time around it's not like the odds are better back in the day we used to say oh you have all this like tough scar tissue it's going to anchor it in and that was wrong information it's actually weaker so it's more prone to do it a second time if that was the case if you had your nipples pierced and they rejected you'd have to do it a slightly different angle so we're not going through that same scar tissue and then you'd be fine but if they didn't reject you just took them out on your own I don't know why you do that. Sometimes jobs, sometimes life happens. But yeah, get it repaired. Totally fine. Totally fine. Absolutely. Um, from Arif. Uh, Arif, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm doing my best with the names. <laughs> uh, hi from Turkey. All countries in the world need a great professional piercer like you. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. There are a lot of great piercers out there. It's just... um. I know America here and over in some places in Europe, like we got a little bit more of a head start with a modern piercing movement. Um, I know here in America, it started in like 1975 when the gauntlet formed who I'm going to be taking a class at the APP this year. I'm definitely going. So if you're a piercer, make sure you come over and say hi to us. Um, but there was a class. What, who was it? Someone from Europe who was a tattoo artist who was piercing in the fifties. So I'm totally going to get some information. I'm going to relay more of this information to you. And uh, yeah, there's some people I definitely would like to interview. And that's kind of my goal at APP this year is get some more historical references and see if I can uh, get some legends and uh, introduce you guys to some really pe cool people. So there's some really interesting, cool people out in the piercing industry. Truly. Yes. <laughs> Uh, from Sarah M. I need to get pierced by you guys soon. Absolutely. Come on in. We anytime. would love to have you in. Yep. Just make sure you make an appointment. Yep. We book up quick. Yes, we do. Yep. Uh, we've got two more questions from uh, Pirelli. Uh, do you sure. do consults? Uh, while checking your site, I didn't see a clear-cut consult option for appointments. There is a checkup option, but it's bundled with jewelry change. What would that be if I'd choose? Uh, and yeah, you would you would just choose uh, the jewelry change slash checkup. Correct. Uh, we kind of bundle everything together uh, to make it a little, a little more simple. Um, but yeah, it's kind of the same thing. If you're having a problem, a question, you, you're not sure, you can do that. And even if you wanted to, it's like if you, like I said, I want to do a consult because I'm not sure if I have the anatomy for this piercing. You can always book the appointment for the piercing. Yep. And if you don't get it, we're not going to charge you. It's like that turns into the consult at that point. Yep. Um, the reason we do the appointments the way it is and we take deposits is if people don't call and don't show up because it does happen. Some people just like make these appointments, take the time away from everyone else, and then we can't fit anyone in. And it's just it's wasting everyone's time. So that just secures your spot. If you don't have the anatomy, you don't have a situation where it's not going to be the right piercing for you, we're not going to charge you. We just make sure that you show up so we can talk to you about it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. And uh, he did have a follow-up question sure. that said, uh, do you carry any glow-in-the-dark jewelry? And if not, what would what site would you recommend I purchase them? I once saw a stripper with a glow-in-the-dark VCH, and it was like a moth to a flame. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it was the jewelry, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so... I, in the past, have really, really pushed away from the glow-in-the-dark jewelry. I don't really quite understand it, and when we don't understand it, you know, it's just... Because I, I remember hearing all the things about, like, all the phosphorus, how it could be carcinogenic, it's radioactive, like, on the watches. I'm not sure what the new modern glow-in-the-dark is, and if it is safe long-term, but a lot of times it's projected into a piece of plastic or acrylic, which is generally not safe. So, um, I don't know. Like, I've seen tongue piercings before where they have, like, a little slot where you put, like, a little glow stick in there. That stuff could break open. I don't know if it's toxic. I'm pretty sure it's probably safe for your mouth at that point in time. 
Uh, we were talking about vibrating tongue rings last week. And like, I remember back there, there was a bunch of acid burns, you know, because they'd break out open inside the mouth and there's a lot of problems. And apparently they're still around. Um, but as far as glow in the dark, I don't really know. I don't ever condone plastic. Plastics only for retainers, for keeping a hole open for a very short amount of time. Yep. Any, any two cents on the glow in the dark? I really don't know how safe glow in the dark stuff really is. Um, my two cents would be if you want to wear it, make sure it's super healed and you aren't wearing it for a super, a super long yeah, time. Yeah, like if you're going out to the club, you're just wearing it for a couple hours or so and then you change it when you get home or something. But yeah, generally it's not the highest quality of Julian. I don't have a site I could recommend. Agreed. Uh, from Rebecca B, uh, I know you recommend sterile saline, but I previously, or I was using Provon on all of my piercings for years until I got my Doth piercing. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Doth is doing well, just occasional emu oil. Uh, thoughts, I guess, on Provon. Sure. Provon is an antimicrobial soap, and I used to push it quite a bit back in the day, and, um, it's nice for the skin, but at the same time, it's a little too harsh for a piercing, in my opinion. Um, we were using it, and once we switched to just the sterile saline, I found that everything started healing up. I hate throwing a stat out there without having numbers to back it up, but it seemed like things were like twice as fast and half as many problems. Provon's a great soap for cleaning around the area, I think. Probably more antibacterial instead of the anti... I don't know. What is the... Antimicrobial gets rid of everything? Is that... How, what was the difference between antibacterial and antimicrobial? I always get them mixed up. Um, I actually don't remember. I will double check that. Though. I think I'm pretty sure antimicrobial is way more strong and harsh than an antibacterial. Uh, let's see. The antimicrobial is, um, yeah. So it kills all microbes. So bacteria, mold, fungi, viruses. Yes. Antibacterial is only effective against bacteria. So antimicrobial kills everything. Yeah. The good stuff. The bad stuff. All of See, and I, and I think that's what a lot of surgeons are going to be using for, like, scrubbing their hands and things like that before yeah. they actually have an opera, you know, to get rid of everything. But as far as, like, we need some bacteria in that area, we have good stuff and bad stuff, right? Yeah, so you got to make sure not to let your body do its thing. Um, if you ever had, like, a cut, um, an operation, and like, suture stitches, they don't ever tell you to clean with soap. They tell you to try to keep the area away, actually even keep it dry, try not to get it wet. Um, and let your body just naturally heal it up. And that's generally the best route. The wound wash spray, which is sterile saline, is preventing the crusties from sticking to your piercing and your jewelry. And that's the main purpose, in my opinion, is to prevent those problems. Um, technically, if you didn't have any crusties and you were healing that thing closed, you wouldn't need anything at all. But the fact that we're keeping making it an open wound, we need to keep the crusties off so it can heal. Yeah, I think that's a great summary. And ultimately this is just a wound that we're trying to heal and i feel like a lot of people know how to heal wounds mm -hmm. which is just keep keep the area clean uh and um yeah i've been in the industry almost yeah. 30 years and it's amazing the different changes of the aftercare and the ideas and how things are done and it kept changing throughout time and i think uh after the 30 years of my career like we're on the wound wash and we've been here for probably a decade or two and it's really really amazing and it's the best answer it allows your body to do the healing it prevents the problems yep. and it's quick and easy which allows people to you know that could be a huge part of it too just the fact that it's easier to do instead of all this manipulating cleaning scrubbing it's just you spray it on there and wipe crusties off and you're done move on absolutely less is more <laughs> truth um from TBHWY, uh, hi, finally made it to the live. Greetings from Finland. By oh. the way, currently healing a bridge, my 15th piercing. Uh, Kitos. Awesome. <laughs> that's Congratulations. The, that's the only word in Finnish I know. I, do I want to know what that means? It just means hello. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Welcome in. I know Glad it, you finally made it here. I know it because of my obsession with Finnish power metal when I was a little younger. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yep. Uh, from Kevin, uh, hi guys, love the channel. Uh, how will I know when my nose piercing is ready for a ring uh, or hoop? Sure. Uh, I'm a few months away from the one year mark. Uh, you could be ready. Um, generally I tell people a minimum of four months. That's under perfect circumstances where you're getting pierced with a material that is uh, biocompatible. You're going to be able to heal it up nice and quick. You never had any bumps or any issues. It's not one of those L's or nostril screws. Those move around and cause a lot longer healing, healing time. Um, and then uh, 
yeah, if you haven't had any irritations or bumps, you could probably try the hoop in there. And if it does get too irritated, switch back to the stud, wait a little bit longer. But yeah, minimum four to six months. So you should be good. Awesome. Uh, from silently judging you, my nose is crying for Nova. Uh, same thing happened with my night right, right nostril too. It took six months to go away. Yeah, I'm, I've been fighting it for, for almost three now. And uh, they're finally starting to clear up, luckily. Um, but yeah, nostril, nostril irritation bumps can take a while to go away for sure. You know what? Our community is like one giant support group for piercing bumps. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, that is absolutely the case. <laughs> um, you'll get through it. We'll, we'll get through it. Uh, from GNVR, Govna, Govna. Uh, hey, I was binge watching the piercing videos last night. Hope your live stream goes well. Thank you. Thank you. Glad you're here. Love having everyone here and, uh, keeping this chat going so amazing oh apparently ketos means thank you okay that's right it does mean thank you <laughs> they say that at the end of the show that's right oh no <laughs> oh well that's i tried so funny. that's so funny well ketos you know what it means? The, yeah, it's, yeah it means hello i'm like no <laughs> ketos for telling me <laughs> <laughs> um moving on uh from brandon greetings brandon. from minnesota good to see you scott hey yes glad you're who is this brandon brandon shower okay yes yes how you doing brandon good to see not see you but i'm glad you can see me <laughs> <laughs> old friend there yep absolutely Cab uh, from cabin days and stuff oh that's rad uh from toasty cheesy uh scott could you please explain the advantages slash disadvantages of different microdermal anchors specifically the three different anatomical dermal anchor designs okay um I don't generally get anatomical jewelry, so I'm not 100% of their designs. But if I had to guess, I'm going to guess there's three different ones. And there's going to be a solid one, a hole, and probably a couple dots. Let's see if I'm right here. Are you looking it up, Nova? Yep. Cool. Drawing time. Cool. All right. So these are the three different styles that I've ever noticed. Let's see if I can go up the right direction. Now, this one here is a solid plate, big foot basically, um, that has no holes drilled through it. And these ones don't anchor in as well. Basically, what you do is you make the incision, you slide this part in, and then the bottom heel here just kind of snaps in. But there's nothing anchoring it in other than the skin closing up over the top of it. The other part I've seen by them, I think, is a very large hole on the front, which gives you a lot more surface for the skin to grow through. And sometimes there's just a little tiny bit of a hole in the bottom to kind of anchor it in there. And then the last one that I know about is going to be where there's like two small ones here and one small one here. Um, so it looks like they actually do have a slightly different design on, on one of them. Let's see what we got. Was, was that close? Um, pretty close. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. You got the little uh, fork on the on the end there i have never used those ones i was close on two of them two out of three that's not too bad but yeah those ones um yeah i imagine they're gonna they're gonna stay put a little bit better so they're not gonna rock back and forth but they're not gonna be anchored in so you can still get them out a little bit easier i really like that design i would probably use that design if i was still doing the surf anchors. they're illegal here in las vegas now but yeah that seems like a really cool one agreed yeah yeah but anyways um yeah it's like sometimes you have the holes going through the middle so a lot of times they can't be pulled out as easy you almost need to break them free or sometimes you take the needle and you slide it in there and that's actually gonna sever the, the actual connection and allows you to pull it back out so it's just whether it's a semi-permanent or just held in by the pressure of the skin on the top awesome yeah. thank you that was a good question i forgot about those ones <laughs> yeah me too uh from ebso uh hey scott love your channel question you. though i got my anti-eyebrow about eight months ago and about three months it began lifting quite a bit uh but it hasn't gotten worse or rejected is this normal was this anti-eyebrow you said yes okay um yeah can you read the question one more time when did it start lifting uh, he got it done about eight months ago. About three months ago, it began lifting a bit, uh, okay. but it hasn't gotten worse or rejected. Is this normal? 
sometimes it happens the anti-eyebrow that skin is super super thin and soft there so it's uh sometimes it takes a while for that that fistula type of tissue to shrink up a little bit sometimes the swelling goes down and it's going to make it seem like it goes more to the surface unless it is actually surfacing but the big thing would be is the ends of the bars um set that down um the ends of the bars, if you see the angle of it coming out, that's the problem. If it's just like they're raising a little bit, sometimes that does happen. It's unfortunate because we want them to be flat and flush, but it can work that way as long as you're okay with it. If you're not okay with it, you can take it out and try it again. But once they reject all the way out, you have a big scar and it's less than, more of a chance of it rejecting again. So be careful with that. Yep. Anti-eyebrows are tough. Any surface piercings like that are tough. Yes. Uh, from Jude Waldo, uh, got my septum done in late November. It healed up great. Having surgery May 10th, do I need to throw in a retainer? It's not a bad idea if they're going to allow you to do that. Get a plastic or glass retainer and you'll be able to flip it up. They won't even know it's there. It won't get in the way. The only issue is if you have an operation, if they have to use any sort of tubes that go in your nose or something, that could interfere. So um, so bring it up to them and ask them about it, if it's going to be in the way or if you need to, what needs to happen. But if you can wear a retainer, that's optimal and that's going to be the best bet. Awesome. Yep. Um, let's see. Where was I? Uh, caffeinated bunny. I love the name. Uh, hi from the UK. Uh, following, following on from the preparing for their first tattoo question. Yes. Sorry. That took me a second to read. Uh, any tips for a long all day tattoo sitting? My longest was five and a half hours where I'm going, uh, for the start of an arm sleeve. What's the longest you've ever sat, Scott? Um, I don't like five hours and I'm yeah. done. Yeah. I'm done. Like I start getting kind of like cold sweats and my body just says no. And I've even the tattoo artist tell me like, you're just not, you're not holding ink anymore. It's just pushing out. I don't, yep. it's hard to believe what the body eventually is. Everyone has different thresholds. Now, the other thing, too, is if you're starting a sleeve for an all-day session, um, there might be a couple hours alone of just trying to get the outline on there, getting it straight, getting things lined up, and then you're going to probably blast away half the time of just trying to get the outline or getting those lines on there so it's established and you have something to start with. That's generally how it goes in my experience. I know sometimes, like, when I worked at tattoo shops, and someone's getting a back piece, and it's like I've seen them have to take those those stencils and you put them on many different times and angle and erase it. It's not centered. This that's a permanent thing. So and it's a lot of work to get that stencil on correctly. And also keep in mind it's on a piece of paper normally that stencil, and then they're put it on a round part of the body so things don't line up and go smooth. But you can't really attack the tattoo until it's lined up properly. So that'd be my guess. You're probably still only involved for like a four to five hour tattoo not a full full day you could be though um but again not everyone can do it i know there's a lot of tattoo artists that are like oh i do a tap out session and i think that's mostly in their favor it's like yeah seven hundred dollars or eight hundred dollars for all day or something whatever it might be maybe a thousand dollars but like i said i can't sit more than four or five hours so i'd be wasting my money at that point yeah so yeah uh, yeah i don't think there's really any any additional information we can give other than make sure you stay it's super hydrated. Um, make good sure, sleep. Yes. Yeah, carb out the night before. Yeah. Make sure you have a plan for food um, throughout the day. Eat, eat a good breakfast, eat lunch, eat Snacks, dinner. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, and fuel. Yeah. Fuel is probably good. Uh, ibuprofen <laughs> whenever you're done for sure. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's a, no a, drugs or alcohol. It'll shorten the, shorten the stay. Yeah, it'll make it work. And a lot of people freak out, like, oh, I'm going to put numbing cream on and things like that. I mean, if your tattoo artist allows that, generally it's best to use that sort of numbing cream after if that was the case. Like, if I can only sit for five hours and it's like, we have two hours, you have to get this done. That's when I want the numbing cream. Yep. Like, yeah. Don't do it at the beginning. You do it at the end if you were to use that. So. Yep. I have I I have definitely done that <laughs> on on my leg. I was just like, okay, I, it's time. <laughs> I don't care anymore. I, I know, like back teen has done that for me before. It's not a huge numbing thing, you know. And it's just, yeah. But I mean, it's like when I got to the point where I'm sitting my leg, like I have to finish this up. I only have 45 more minutes, and they spray the back teen, let it sit on there for five ten minutes, and I'm good to go for another hour. It's amazing. Yeah. Just back teen alone. So. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Good question. Yes, it and is. Shout out. Cheers to everyone. Thanks for being here. We love you all. Yes, we do. Shout out to Dutch Brothers, too. Still looking out for that sponsorship. We love Dutch Brothers. 
<laughs> um, well, I, also, I shouldn't speak for everyone, but yes. you should. <laughs> it's true. Um, cool. So we've got one from K Dub. Hey Scott, I got my nose pierced with a libre instead of uh, an L shape. Is this normal? It is for me. Um, typically, there's two different styles of jewelry. There's the nostril screw or the threadless jewelry. The threadless jewelry is where it has the disc on the inside, and the gem normally pushes in. It's normally held in by pressure. I have seen some people use threaded jewelry on that one where they screw it in there. Um, generally, when people are using threaded jewelry, I'm not as big of a fan because they put a 4 millimeter disc, which is a huge clunky piece of metal on the inside of your nose. And less is much better in a situation like this. There's less surface area for those boogers and crusties to stick to if you use the two and a half millimeter as opposed to the four millimeter disc. Um, the L's are pretty old school. Uh, technically, L's don't exist. They're supposed to be nostril screws. And nostril screws kind of used to be bent to fit to each person. And because a lot of people never continued education and never learned how to do it, an L's a lot easier than the nostril screw to bend, and it's a lot easier to get in. Technically, if you bend a nostril screw properly, it's going to fit much better and be more comfortable than an L. But we've evolved to the threadless jewelry. So the threadless labrette is the answer. Long answer for a quick answer. Yeah. <laughs> God, I talk a lot. Oh, no, that's why we're here. <laughs> that's why we're here. Yeah, it, it's a better option for yep, sure. For sure. Um, another nostril question from Natalia. Sure. Uh, hi, I got a nose piercing over a year ago. Uh, I switched out the stud to a nose bone or to a bone end, uh, and the stud is poking out. Ouch. I do not like nose bones at all. Um, I got to go back to the drawing board here again. Man, I've been on a drawing kick the last couple of weeks, haven't I, guys? All right. So a nose bone is a design by someone who doesn't do piercings. Let's see if I can create Squeak. a fancy gem. <laughs> so this is kind of like a nose bone. This is supposed to be straight one all the way down. But there's this tiny little bead on the inside, and the whole theory is is you push this in, and that little bead holds it in place. But then the skin starts closing up around it, and you got to pull that bead all the way back through, which kind of rips and tears. Now, when you do this back and forth, by the way, this is supposed to be a fancy gem on the top, not a flower. Um, no, it's a flower, I mean. Um, <laughs> anyway, be a flower end. Yeah, you take this in and out a couple times, and it creates more and more scar tissue, which can cause a big bumps to grow on the outside of your nose, and a very discolored color, discolored piercing. So nose bones you're going to find at a lot of cheaper places. Um, it's just a bad idea. Again, you want to use uh, a labrette post, which is going to have a small disc on the inside, and then the gem has a little pin with a small bend, and that little tiny bend keeps it in, keeps it in, so it's held in by pressure. So, So those are the best ones. And then, like I said, a nostril screw is supposed to be like a little corkscrew twist like so. This is supposed to be a 90-degree angle. It's not like a loop around like that. But, but anyways, and the nostril L's just fall out. So, yeah. I like drawing for you guys. <laughs> we love it, too. <laughs> yeah, nose bones are tough. They're they're very they're common because they're cheap to make. I think is is why they're so common. I don't know if I've ever seen anyone in a high quality shop sell a nose bone. Yeah, that says agreed. something. You're only going to find them on Amazon and places like that. Yep, yep. Uh, from Funky, uh, hi. Sent an email to the email in the description uh, as I am unable to do one via video form. I hope that's okay. And he is referring to the uh, the piercing sh the piercing show. Correct. Yes, account. I'm still planning on doing the piercing show where we're going to do video questions. Um, did they say they sent one in, but not the video form? Oh uh, yeah, they, they said that they were unable to do it in video form. Oh bummer, bummer. We'll still try to figure something out for you. That's still planning on coming out. That's just a lot more editing and a lot more video shooting that I need to do, and that's coming out in the future here. But in the meantime, we're going to turn this into a little podcast, and we also have some short stuff coming out soon too. So Yes, we do. Keep an eye Keep out. An eye out. <laughs> uh, from Joanna. Hey there, guys. Uh, on the last live stream, I asked what you think about vertical librettes, and today I happily report that I got one done, and it's healing perfectly. Yay! Love it. Congratulations on that. Vertical Brett's my favorite of the oral piercings. And recently they're starting to get so popular by doing like those uh, orc bites or like angel fangs or the angel. Yeah, angel fangs. I was thinking devil fangs. Not, like <laughs> devil fangs. Nope, you, yeah. you got it. Yeah, there's so many different combinations and fun things you can do with that. So, Absolutely yeah. agreed. 
Um, let's see. Uh, from- you know what I haven't seen hmm. is the doubles. You know how you do like spider bites or like you know like. Oh yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, yeah. Like do two, doubles. Uh, what would it, what? Who has two fangs? Um, what would we name that one after? I don't know. We'll figure some some sort of demon or monster. Of, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that'd be cool though. Yeah. Could you do it? Could you do them on the top and the bottom? What would happen? I guess you'd have to make sure the beads didn't overlap. But you know, it'd be weird. <laughs> yeah. There's a couple of spikes where they're kind of overlapping. And you would have a bad time, probably. <laughs> um, and oops, sorry, I, I accidentally skipped uh, Ursula's odds and sods. Oh, um, we can't skip Ursula. Never. Uh, let's see. Is a Hi, circular Ursula. barbell with a cir- with a cluster center okay to wear for an initial septum piercing? So like a circular, a circular, but with like, like a cluster in the center. I can't picture it. Really? Oh, we, we used to do, I used to do them all the time. Are you talking about doing like a captive in the middle of those two beads? Uh, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's like a, it's like a captive cluster in the center of the two beads. We used to use them on, uh, we used to get them from like anatomical and would, would use them in doths and septums and stuff. Um, I would do them on initial septums, but not doths. Yes. Uh, He's going to try to pull them up here and see if he can count. Because I know back in the day, like a circular barbell, you have that little the ring with the two beads on there. And those little beads, sometimes you can fit in a third bead in the middle. You know, it's held like a captive bead ring because those yeah. other ones have little dimples. And that's kind of the same concept, except you're saying like it's a cluster with a captive on the inside. Yeah, it's like this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, those are absolutely beautiful. Um, Yeah, for septum, that's totally fine. Why wouldn't you do that on a doth? Uh, just not on an initial doth. Take up too much space because you have yeah, to make to a clean. larger room for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just because it like with the septum, everything is kind of sticking out of it, you know, and it's yeah. like, it's a lot easier to clean. But it with, depends on the cluster too. Yeah, with with doths like these larger cl- yeah, I would do like a single gem or something along those lines in a doth. Uh, but like if you were looking to do something like this, uh, I would usually make you wait. Um. Just because it can be kind of difficult to clean behind. Yeah, those are beautiful. Yeah, they're cool. Super fun. Cool. Yeah, I forgot about those. They're not as popular anymore. Things come and go, but they always come back, you know? Yeah, it's true. It's like those uh, those five gem clusters. Um, they used to be super popular, but yeah, we just don't anymore. do near as many anymore. And back in the day, it's like every other one was a five gem cluster. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Uh, Snoopy the Crocodile following up. Uh, they said that their nipple piercing is two years old already, and they decided to do it after watching your channel. Thanks for the advice on measurements of jewelry. You're very welcome. I hope this works out for you. And uh, yeah, and be patient. When you put them in there, they're going to be, they don't move around like normal piercings. Like if you need to move the ring, make sure it's lubricated. And it will be a little irritated for a couple days to get used to, but uh, they're pretty awesome. I love having rings in my nipples. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Um, Sammy following up about the, uh, the, the stone plugs. Yes. Uh, she said, yeah, uh, wood plugs and tunnels scare me. I'm too afraid to get wood for my lobes. Uh, I don't know what wood is safe. And I've also heard that wood can wood swells sometimes. Yes. And no. Um, okay. Let's talk about wood plugs because I'm a huge, huge fan of wood plugs. Now there's a couple woods that you can use, which are generally not problematic at all, which are going to be like maple, um, ebony, uh, um, Chechen. Okay. The best advice I can give to you is if you go to a website called America.com, O M E R I C A. Um, and they sell wood plugs and that's all they do. And there's only like six or seven types of woods they use, which are all completely safe and compatible. They're real simple woods. Now, once you start getting into the fancier stuff, like I've never heard of this, like Coca Bolo or uh, uh, Tiger Stripe or all these, and if they look too fancy, they cause problems. Like walnut. Walnut, when that tree grows, um, it kills everything, all living plants within a 20 foot radius around it. So it gets all the nutrients itself. So it sends the toxins out in the ground. I mean, that tells you how toxic something like that could be. So if you stick to those basic, uh, six different ones, which is Chechen, um, olive wood, ebony, they're, I'm drawing blanks. Anyways, America.com has the list of those woods and then they're safe. As far as the swelling goes, yeah, they do swell, but a good wood manufacturer knows this. And that's why we do wet sanding, which means you do the plug and you're like, oh, cool. I got a plug. Then you soak it in the water. 
You soak it for like 30 seconds or a minute and you pull it back out. The water goes into the wood and swells. Then you do a wet sand. You sand it down again. You dip it in again. You pull it out. You do another sand. A lot of times this happens like three, four, maybe five times, I think, before they're done. And then when you pull it back out, all that swelling's done because it's already been waterlogged. The swelling goes out and then it stays nice and smooth. Then with the wood plugs, they're generally going to oil treat it, like some sort of a like mineral oil, olive oil. I'm not sure what kind of oil the companies use. And then it's treated on top of that with a beeswax where they take a polishing wheel and that fills in all the gaps on the inside. So I've worn plugs in my nostrils and I've had them for years. And as long as you keep them clean and you uh, keep re-oiling them and maintain them, and if you need to get a little beeswax on there, it, you can wear those plugs forever. And it's not a problem and they're really comfortable. But when you get questionable woods, questionable designs, that's when you start running into problems. But wood plugs are great. I even wore mine in the showers and never had any problems with it. And this is a mucus membrane in my nostrils and I'm wearing them. And some areas look a little darker than others from the oils, but it works just fine. Heck yeah. Yeah. I love wood plugs. <laughs> they're cool. Yeah. For sure. Everyone's so afraid of them. And it's just because everyone always tries to go for the most exotic, craziest looking things. And those oils will cause problems. And once you swell up, you need to get hydrocortisone shots and it's a series and you lose all the stretching sizes and you go way back down. And it's just like, never, I'm never doing wood again. I'll stick to the safe stuff and you'll be fine. Agreed. Yep. Uh, V, ch- v chimed in and said, uh, I have to say the healthier I eat, the better my piercings heal for sure. Uh, now I just have to keep that healthy diet 24 seven. Absolutely. Agreed. It's a good thing in general, but yeah, I, same thing with tattoos. Like I talked to my buddy, Tom Strom, who's very famous tattoo artist. And he's just like, yeah, the healthier the person comes in, if they're fit, they heal things up a lot smoother and faster. And the the less healthy you are, the longer the healing process goes. That's with anything. So yeah. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. I can definitely, definitely speak to that too. The, the healthier I am, like the more, especially once I started lifting heavily, um, things just started going way more smoothly. And age is a factor too. That too. I can't heal <laughs> things as fast as when I was like 18 years old. Now that I'm like 19 years old. The good old days. Yeah, the good old days. Uh, <laughs> we've got Brianne Marie actually in the uh, in the chat. Hello from Michigan. Uh, Hello. It's my goal to come see you for a future piercing. Uh, currently at 30 of them. Awesome, awesome. Well, here's the cool thing. We're in Las Vegas. So not only can you come to Las Vegas and have a great time, see some entertainment, great food, um it's just such an entertainment fun place to be then you come get pierced by me and we'd love to see you absolutely yeah we are appointment only though so (laughs) make make sure to book one (laughs) but it's not like you have to fly across the country to go get a piercing and just turn around fly back it's true it's like you figure out the time when there's a concert coming here that you know of or there's a show because i guarantee you there's shows you'd probably want to see here there are a lot of fun ones plan a trip and it's like make it an epic journey an epic piercing journey it is yeah Scott's and Scott's you, epic. And you know what? Journey. In our shop, I have a couple maps. I have one of the world and one of the United States. And it's one of those pin maps. And if you come in from another country or another state or location, put a pin on that map. It's starting to fill up and I'm getting people from all over the world on there. And it is really uh, cool. It's a point of pride of mine. It's pretty fun to I've pierced people from all over the world. It's true. Pretty almost yeah. every continent, I think. Just about, yeah. There's um, one that's pretty far north. I'm not sure if it's real or not. <laughs> Yeah, no penguins have yeah. made it down so far. <laughs> um, from Jax. Uh, hi, Scott, from St. Louis. Uh, I have Hello. a healed flat piercing, and I'm thinking about getting two piercings, one on each side of the flat. Sweet. Uh, will those piercings irritate my healed flat? A little bit. I mean, it depends on how close you get to it, because I'm sure you remember you swell, swelled up quite a bit. And if you still have that original post, it's not a bad idea to maybe put that larger post in there while you're healing up those other ones until you downsize again. Again, downsizing is crucial after maybe a month to two months. You need to put that shorter post in so it doesn't change angles, but it depends on how close you go to it. I mean, if it's not affecting it, you might not need to downsize, but that area will swell up quite a bit, especially if you're doing both of the one on each side, then I would definitely put the longer one in. Yes. Awesome good question. It is a you good have question. to accommodate for old piercings. Yeah. Otherwise that disc is going to get sucked in and they're just going to get really upset. And the more that gets upset, it swells and then causes more problems on the fresh piercings. Yep. A it's a bad cycle. time. <laughs> yeah. It's a bad time. Uh, from just Erica. Uh, hi, I want to get my tragus pierced, but I have a small tragus. Can I still get it pierced? Uh, also, I just got a flat piercing uh, and I really bled for the first time and it hurt. Uh, is this normal? I've had 19 piercings and this has never happened. Um, 
sometimes cartilage bleeds. Uh, what was the first part of the question? I can't. Um, I have a small tragus. Can small. I still get it pierced? Maybe. You Maybe. have to talk to your piercer. Um, I have said no to people before because it just goes really wide right away. And it's like there's no room for that disc to sit in there. And it would be nothing but problems. But most people can get it pierced. The thing about a tragus is they, they don't sit out flat like this so you can see how big they are. They sit flat back to your face like so. So when you're looking on, you're looking at the angle back and you can't see. So take a picture from the side and you might be surprised. It's actually more protruding than you think. Um, and then the second part of the question was, what was that again? That was... Um, they got a flat piercing and bled more than normal. And okay. They said that it really hurt, uh, that they had 19 piercings and that had never happened. A um, couple questions, like, yep. did you go to the same piercer? Because that can be a factor. They use different needles, different techniques. Um, sometimes if you're stressed out, you don't get a good night's sleep, you're going on there on an empty stomach, you're going to have a, a rougher healing or a rougher piercing process. So sometimes they're more painful just depending on the day. And then as far as the bleeding goes, generally cartilage doesn't bleed because there's not a lot of blood flow to there. Um, typically when they bleed, they typically heal faster than normal. So it's actually kind of a good sign if it bled a little bit. Now, if you went to another piercer that you don't know, and uh, a lot of piercers or tattoo artists who think they're piercers will pierce an oversized needle, like one way too big because the cheap jewelry fits inside the needle they pull the needle out and then the jewelry's in, but there's no pressure being put on there, which is why you would bleed too. So if it bled a lot and it was really hurt, painful, and you're going to a piercer you normally don't go to, it could have been the piercer too. But it could happen. It's true. It's yep. hard to tell. Yep. I know when I got my bridge piercing, I normally don't bleed. Um, and when I got my bridge piercing, like before... That's the quote. I normally don't bleed. I, I don't bleed. <laughs> Can't kill me. That ain't right, buddy. <laughs> uh, I I typically don't bleed as much uh, when I get pierced. Even when I got my PA, like I I had a little bit of spotting like in, immediately, and then didn't bleed at all. Um, but when I got my bridge pierced, like before Kate even cleared the bevel, it yeah. was like gushing. So it just depends. Sometimes it does happen. Yep. Hey, I do want to say this. Like uh, this week, I did have someone come in. And I actually pierced a reverse PA on them before. And I've also done a pubic and a couple other piercings. And the pubic is healing, which is super, super cool. That's like a 10-gauge curved barbell. I think, no, it's an 8-gauge curved barbell about an inch and a quarter from where the, the shaft of the penis meets the body in that little crease right there. So that's healing up beautifully. But he had a reverse PA, which goes in the urethra and out the head of the penis. And he wanted to do a regular PA as well. So he had a ring coming out the top. And went out the bottom, kind of like a figure eight on there. And it was, uh, I've never done the combo like that before. It's not real common. It sure did look pretty darn cool, though. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Reverse PA with a regular PA. Yeah, like, I forgot you just about don't that. want an Apadravi? He's like, no, I want two rings. I'm like, let's do this. <laughs> That's rad. Pretty awesome. It was really cool. That's awesome. If he comes back in, I want to see it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think he watches this. So if you're watching, cool. Yeah. Come hop back in. Yeah. So I can look. <laughs> That's rad. Uh, from Carla T. Uh, hi, Scott. Are you still doing the separate channel, The Piercing Show? I uh, wanted to share some pictures of my troubled piercing, or are you doing them here with a live stream? Nope, that is still going to be going on to that show. I just need, I'm kind of waiting for the a little bit warmer weather to go talk to people on the strip and kind of get things going. And we're just starting to get a grip on the technology we have at our hands. Uh, before, yes. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. It's a learning curve, and it's taking longer than we anticipated, but we're getting there. We're getting there. Yes, we are. That piercing show, I'm really looking forward to it. It's, it's one of my dreams as far as, like, there's... This whole piercing channel is like, I always had this vision of this show of all these parts and kind of putting together and it's, uh, we're close. We are. Close. We're close. I'm, uh, I also will take a lot of the blame. I am, I am learning, uh, all of the video and, and stuff. I have an, a little bit of an audio background, but video is a little new to me. Yeah. We're getting there though. We're yep. getting there. Yes, we are. <laughs> you know what? I'm having a bad mustache day. It might look all right, but it is just. Feels like it's going right up my nose. All Tickling day. you, <laughs> it's, it, dude. I swear it's the pollen too. It's been. It could brutal. be it too. It's just yeah. It's it's tickling my nose. It's brutal. Yeah. Uh, for, for those of you who don't have mustache, you're probably like, yeah, I don't know how anyone could do it. It's like it's one of those days. It's yeah. <laughs> uh, from Jen, uh, what age do you think is appropriate for angel fangs? <sighs> okay, my personal opinion, I want to say eighteen, because. This is going to leave big scars on your face, like two on each side. 
Um, it's not as visible inside the lip color area, but up above on your lip, it will leave a scar. Um, that's the only part I don't like is I don't like scarring people who aren't 100% sure where their life is going yet. Um, you may think like, oh, I'm going to be an accountant or, oh, I'm going to be a lawyer or oh, I'm going to be a doctor or I'm going to, you know, like things change. You know, we go to school, our majors change. Once we get our degree, some people don't even follow in that same path. Like I was supposed to be working on electronic music technology, fixing keyboards, amplifiers, and microphones. And here I am talking into one and stabbing people. So you never know where the future holds. And that's the only part. And then what if you're in a group of people to get that one job where you're getting paid millions of dollars a year and you don't get that job because you have all those extra scars or tattoos on your face from when you're younger. It's true. It's a possibility, you know, and it's something you should consider it shouldn't be the biggest factor but it's something you should consider that's why i like to i don't love doing eyebrow piercings on minors same thing it leaves a big scar you know but at the same time you're not alone in the that work field but when it comes down to like two people and someone has less tattoos less piercings and looks more professional the other person gets the job it's reality it's true so that's why I say that. Otherwise, I'm going to say 16 and up. The youngest I ever pierced is going to be 16 besides your lobes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, awesome. But, oh, and kids, I guess. Oh, you said kids, besides yeah. earlobes. Besides yeah. earlobes, yeah. Um, no angel fangs on any. <laughs> five and up. Five and up. That's the youngest I'll go. Yeah, we do angel fangs on infants, actually. <laughs> <laughs> For legal purposes, that was a joke. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, from Aaron J. Uh, hi, I recently got both my nipples pierced uh, five days ago. Uh, the piercer used a t uh, 12 gauge 9 16th straight barbell. Cool. Uh, will the larger gauge help with the healing? Uh, will I need to size down the length? Um, it depends. Everyone's nipple anatomy is different as far as like the length goes. A lot of people wear 9 16ths just fine, and you have to have a little tiny bit of extra room so you have room for any swelling, um, irritation, things like that. And when you lay down, like the chest sometimes spreads out and it relaxes a little bit too so 12 gauge in my opinion if you can support a 12 gauge i think they're better than the 14 the issue is is society only sells not only but mainly sells 14 gauge nipple jewelry and everyone has the idea that oh the thinner is cuter so everyone wants the 14 gauge jewelry and people even freak out like oh i don't want it to be that thick Back in the day, I only did 12 gauge nipple pier nipple bars, even on guys, you know, just get a little bit deeper and they secure in there much more comfortably and they do heal nicer, but most people don't want the look of the thicker bar. That's what it comes down to. It's true. Yep. I did, do though. You yeah. pierce me at a 12 gauge. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> um, only the best for you, buddy. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, from Kevin, uh, is there anything that you can do to reduce scarring in a bridge piercing if it needs to be taken out? Uh, I am nervous. Uh, I want to get one, but I'm nervous it will reject and scar. Don't let it reject all the way out. That's how you end up with a huge, massive scar. Um, but at the same time, um, you can kind of see my bridge here. I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit, and you, you're going to see how there's a little bit of bumps on there. Not a ton. Um, but they are there and I generally don't scar very much, but mine were all done with 14 or 12 gauge. I've never done anything thinner than that. So that's also a part of it. I think I've had mine done six or seven times each now. So yeah. So as, as you can see now there's scar tissue removers, but that little divot's always going to be there. You can just minimize color and you can soften that tissue, but you're going to have a little bit of scarring. And if the scar is an issue, I wouldn't do it. Yep. Agreed. Mine is mine is a twelve gauge. Also, I yeah. think. Uh, let's see. From Lucky. Uh, hi from California. I want to get Hello. my filtrum pierced, uh, but I'm also starting Sure Smile. Uh, basically Invisalign soon. Uh, in what capacity do you think they'll affect each other? That's a good question. Yeah, it really is. I'm not a hundred percent sure. I mean, that's like a mouth guard thing. Yeah, I I believe it's like they send you. Like mouth guards that you sleep in, and it very, very slowly adjusts your teeth until they're straight. It's almost like braces. Here's the deal: it's like if you're getting that done, you're gonna need to heal up your piercing before you start the Invisalign. If that was the case, so you can downsize. There's gonna be a little bit of uh, nesting, which means the disc goes into your lip a little tiny bit, and probably will be okay if you're wearing that Invisalign kind of mouth guard. 
But during the healing process, your lip is going to be swollen. You have to have a longer post. It's going to get caught on that thing all the time. Um, so unfortunately, I would say if, if you wanted the both, you're going to need to get the piercing first. Fully heal it up for probably a month and a half, two months minimum before you can move on to any sort of Invisalign. And I don't think they use chemicals. It's not like whitening. That's just straightening, right? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just straightening. So that'd well, be my two cents. Um, if any of you in the comments have Invisalign and a Medusa or Filtrum piercing, please let us know if it does get in the way. I personally don't know off the top of my head. I think you'd be okay if you downsized, but I've never worn them. Awesome. Um, from Shadow Bites. Uh, hi, t hi from Texas. You pierced me a few months ago, and it was the easiest piercing I've ever healed. Can't wait to make the trip and see you again soon. Awesome, awesome, awesome! Congratulations. I'm glad they healed really nice for you. Yeah, we always appreciate the uh, the feedback. Absolutely. Um, this is a good question from Jesse C. How to ensure a straight appearance? Uh, I'm sorry, a straight appearance when a, a piercing. I'm sorry. Let me try this a third time. <laughs> <laughs> Round three. Jesse C. How to ensure a straight appearance when piercing a deviated septum? Mm. The age-old question. I'm guessing you're a piercer. <laughs> 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 okay, so he here's the deal. Now, what we're talking about with a deviated septum, can you go straight on here? Okay. With a deviated septum, that means your nose is going to be kind of crooked off to one side a little tiny bit, or the center part it's not evenly and it's more off to one side now when we do the piercing and you look straight on like this the ring is going to probably look too far off to one side so what we do is a lot of times i pierce at a slight angle this way which causes the ring to lean back over it is not an easy thing to do it is really really difficult even the most Talented piercers struggle with this because if it's off and you have a very deviated or crooked nose, it's going to accentuate it more. It's tough to balance it out with it being crooked. Um, and then the thing is, is like, if you look back, it's going to look crooked because it's going to be almost leaning on one side of the septum and the yep. ring will be coming out more on the other. But when you're looking straight on, that's how most people look at you. And that's how it's going to look more straight. But if you tilt your head back, it's going to look crooked, but head on, it should look all right. And um, I think also you're not going to want to really wear tiny rings in there. You're going to need to wear a slightly larger ring, if it's, which is going to pull it further over to kind of make it look more centered to your face. If you're wearing a real tight, snug ring, you pierce that angle, it's still going to make it look crooked. It's not an easy thing to do, and it doesn't work for everyone. And then the other thing is with a deviated septum, the cartilage kind of sometimes can pinch like this on the inside. So the piercer really does need to kind of feel to see how much room there is for that sweet spot if you can hit that angle at that. It's complicated. It is. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. But that's how it's done. It's the bane of many piercers' existences. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, sometimes people come in and like, yeah, I want to get my septum pierced. I'm just like... <laughs> <laughs> oh no <laughs> you have any other ideas <laughs> what do you think about a lip piercing <laughs> uh, that's funny yeah um shout out to young uh they said first time joining live hope your day is great scott love your videos welcome in cheers thank you very much uh from funky considering cheek piercings anything i should know beforehand yes yes <laughs> yes. yes okay many things um, Watch my video on cheek piercings. I have a video on uh, the whole truth and just type in cheek piercings. And basically, my big concern is with what happened to Elaine Angel. Elaine Angel wrote the piercing Bible. And basically, she had her cheeks pierced probably a little too far back. And over the years, I believe the salivary glands kind of migrated into that piercing hole. And she started draining out of those holes. And she was getting puddles of saliva on her shoulder. Um, I believe she went in a few times to have them cauterized, to have them shut so she didn't stop leaking through there. But it wouldn't close at that point. It's funny. Like the times you want your piercing to close, it actually doesn't. Excuse me, got the hiccups there. <laughs> At but least once every pod, once yeah, for every real, podcast, for real. Or live stream. But she's had them uh, cauterized a few times, and I think the final results was I think she had to super glue beads or something to kind of hold them in to kind of plug that hole so she doesn't salivate. It's 
it, it can be a problem and that's why i personally don't pierce cheeks i know if you go a little bit further like in front of the molars that minimizes the risk but that's there's a lot going on in there and then the other thing too is is they swell and go back and forth there's many downsizes um they're gonna go back and forth for probably about a year a lot of tissue and um that's not like a normal lip piercing now dahlia's i think heal a lot easier and a little nicer than a cheek piercing does and as far as pain level goes i've had cheek skewers but no needles that's a cheek skewers just like a like a taper a metal pin sharpened to a point where we just kind of shoved it through you've seen pictures and stuff it's it's crazy but it's not very painful it's just kind of more of the shock factor but anyways there can be problems with that when you're done you're gonna have the scar but I think that's a huge reason why a lot of people actually do these piercings. They want the scar out. Yeah, they, they want dimples. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's not exactly like a dimple scar, but but a little bit. So Yeah, it's close. Yeah. <laughs> um, From, let's see, 8 ANS IRL. <laughs> 8 ANS, answer, ANS IRL. I don't know. Uh, hi from France. Uh, I got one snake bite pierced a couple days ago. Uh, so I guess one lip piercing. Yep. Uh, but I noticed that the jewelry is hurting my gum when I brush my, and when I brush my teeth, it bleeds a lot. Uh, I wanted to know if it's okay. Oh, I hope your gums aren't bleeding from the, from the piercing. Yeah, that would not your be lip, good. <laughs> that's another thing. But if your gums are, because it's rubbing up against it, that's a major, major issue. Now, normally when you get a lip piercing, um, we put it in a longer bar so you have room for swelling. Um, and if it's. Your piercing's too far low on your lip and it's rubbing up against your gums. You can get gum erosion where your teeth can eventually fall out. So typically we don't go that low on a lip piercing. Um, did they say how old it was? A couple days? A couple days. Couple yeah, days. a couple days and gums hurting is not a good sign. No, it's probably way too low and you're going to have gum erosion. So if it's eroding right now, you might have to lose the piercing. I really hate saying that, but if you don't believe me, look up uh, uh, gum erosion from, from lip piercings or librette piercings on Google. Yeah, it's And real. you're going to see, and it's, it's a real thing, and it doesn't take that long for the damage to, to be done. And there's not really that much fixing. You can do a little bit of skin grafts, but here's what they have to do. They take the skin off the roof of your mouth. Yeah. Should I pull up a picture? No, no, too we'll, much just, we'll leave this image yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> they take the skin out the roof of your mouth and then they they suture, sew it into your gums. And if I remember right, there's only like a 50% chance it might take. And if it does take, you can't eat solid foods for a month after that during the healing process. That's a rough time. That's rough. One of my old roommates went through it. And it was no thanks. No thanks. So if you're having that many problems, it was probably pierced wrong and it needs to be pierced higher up at a different angle. And then you're going to be able to downsize and you shouldn't have problems. The problems are already right now. It's not good. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Um, Sorry. From the motocross graveyard. Uh, good timing for a live. Got my two and a half inch concave bloodwood plugs in the mail. Woo! Let's go body mod world. And then oh, he's, yeah. and then 69 with a smiley face. <laughs> So you said two and a half inches? Yeah, two and a half inches. That was my last size. Two and a half inches. You can fit like a soda can or a beer can in your ear at that point. That's epic. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. And you said bloodwood? Yep. Bloodwood. Uh, cool. Uh, concave bloodwood plugs. Awesome, awesome. So now there again, we we're talking about different woods and things like that. I've had good luck with bloodwood, but I think some people have had issues. So you just kind of be careful about it. And as long as you keep that polish on there and you know, with the beeswax and so forth, you should be totally fine. But bloodwood is beautiful i love that one yeah it is yeah. it's also the coolest name for a wood <laughs> it is it is um, is that the one where you cut the tree down and it looks like it's bleeding too uh i'm pretty sure i saw that on you like if you guys get a chance you two that like bleeding tree they cut it and it'll no, like blood's not. coming out but it's just oh it's gnarly so yeah yeah my ears used to be two and a half inches and yeah no it's it just how beautiful very, very yeah no, no no you can see the the aptly named blood what you see how it looks oh, like yeah. it's bleeding when you cut it yeah. That's Isn't cool. that crazy? Yeah, that's beautiful. Though. <laughs> yeah, it is. Poor tree. Right. <laughs> um, let's see. Let me get You're back screaming to the right from here. It's true. I I, I did learn words. did you did you know that uh that trees scream when they're cut down? If you you can like it's in a frequency that we can't hear, but if you pitch it up, it sounds like they're screaming. It's like the most horrifying thing I've ever heard. Wow. <laughs> Um, wonder what it is why they don't have vocal cords so you can't uh yeah i guess it, they just like emit emit some kind of sound interesting um, or yeah some isn't that all vibration. plants or is that just trees 
I I mean, I everything emits some yeah. form of vib like waveform uh, vibration. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I know trees. Like I say, do a pretty big one. Hmm. Um, sorry, trees. Yeah, sorry, trees. <laughs> uh, to Ethan White, howdy from Australia. Hello. Uh, are procedures like um, mit- uh, I always struggle with this word. Um, meet mit- uh, metotomies. Uh, and sub incisions legal. It's like the widen the widening of the urethra. Yeah. Uh, I I I don't know. I just can't say it. Uh, I upgraded my PA to a uh met- metotomy. Uh, and all of a sudden I can pee standing up again. That's awesome. So, so, what? How? Okay. A metotomy basically isn't that? It's like a sub incision, but it's a full yeah sub. So yeah, it's yeah. a full cut. Basically, yeah. what this means it's like, like almost a bifurcation. Penis, yeah. yeah. You're gonna okay, and it's a cut. So basically what it does is it kind of opens up and not to be crude, but you know, how like if you're cooking a, mi- a hot dog in a microwave and you cook it too long and it splits. <laughs> yeah. That's what you're doing. Yep. You know, and it gives the illusion that it's actually quite a bit wider, but some people really get into that type of a thing. It's, and it's also full access to the urethra on the bottom. But what was the question? Something about. Um, are they legal in the United States and that and sub incisions? And the answer to that is no. <laughs> no, I don't know anyone who's going to allow that legally, but at the same time, even if it was legal and you advertised it, how many people can walk into the <laughs> It's true. <laughs> no, yeah, we do. Like, so, hey, can you open my urethra? Yeah, like, like what? Until it's not a urethra yeah. anymore. <laughs> so, um, but it's always been the issue is like legality is like people want this stuff done, but surgeons and doctors don't offer it. So we only have one other option to get it done or you can't get it done, which is messed up because it's, yep. know, it's a free world. I have a friend who did his own, actually. Gnarly. Yeah, gnarly. gnarly. He's tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. The peen standing up is an attractive thing, though. Um, that ultimately is why I took my PA out. Well, it was because I forgot. I came home from the bar one mm-hmm. night and just completely forgot. It was like, I was maybe six or seven, maybe eight months, something like that, into having the PA. Okay. And I just peed all over my bathroom because I com- <laughs> like completely forgot that I had to sit down. And I was like, I'm done. Yeah, this is over. <laughs> done. It's done. <laughs> Uh, good times. I actually took mine out and mine won't close. So mm-hmm. now, yeah. You're in like two thirds in the toilet, a third on my left leg. Ouch. That sucks. <laughs> it is what it is. My, the bottom hole. That's it. My bottom hole closed, but the, the like, it, it, like I can, I know that it, it, the wound channel is still there. Yes. But, yeah. um, as awesome. long as it shrinks up enough where it doesn't allow things to come through there. But yeah, yeah. that's the big downfall of Prince Albert's. I mean, it's like urination gets to be really tricky. Some people don't have any problems. Some people is like, oh, it's like a pain in the butt. You just do it all the time where you just have to sit down. And just like, it's not even worth the battle. Um, that was my two cents. That's my, the reason why it's my least favorite starter genital piercing. Everyone always is the go-to is the PA. But I say start with the frenum, which is like the skin on the underside. And it's just a little barbell. It doesn't go through the urethra. It doesn't affect your urination. And it heals just as quick. And it's, yeah, just as effective sexually, I think. So. It's a good one. Yeah. Um, from Dichronic Ribbons. Uh, hi, I was wondering if it's normal for my nipple piercings to still be producing crusties. Uh, one also smells and the other doesn't. I had them done two years ago. Yeah. Um, sometimes crusties happen for, I tell people up to two years and it could be even longer. Everyone's completely different. Um, I'm guessing it's probably the side you sleep on. You know, something's irritating it enough to where your body keeps producing it. There's a reason one side is and the other side's not. Um, and then what was the other part of the question? Um, it's just, is it normal for after two years? Yeah. Yeah. One, yeah. one smells. Is, is it normal oh, the for smell. It still be producing crusties? Yeah. Yeah. If it's getting irritated, your body might, I, olive oil, you know, it's just like when I talk about like the septum stink, like the, basically the dead skin cells absorb kind of into the metal a little bit and kind of create a mask of like funky smells on the outside of your jewelry and you can use like soap and water to try to clean it off for the most part but if you just take like a little olive oil and rub that in or like some sort of a natural cooking oil a lot of times it creates a layer or mask over the top and gets rid of that smell so if it smells bothering you that's the answer cool Mm -hmm. i didn't know that one yep uh from serenity uh i've had my nipples pierced for years Uh, next to my septum and nostrils they were the easiest piercings to heals uh, recent hormonal changes have seen me battling bumps that come and go uh, with some periods. Uh, and I'm not sure if you mean like periods in the context of like timing or in, in the context of menstruation. For what piercings? Nipples. Yes, yes, for yep. sure. Um, 
and that's a real common problem uh not common problem but like sometimes they'll do piercings on women and they'll come back and like yeah once in a while like my piercings act up and they're like like once a month and you're like yep <laughs> and like huh okay and generally yeah, what it happen. is is people like to downsize their bars or wear the smallest possible jewelry because it looks cuter but during menstruation cycles and things like that you uh, you bring on water weight and sometimes the nipples are going to grow and you have to accommodate for that so that's why for nipple piercings you don't ever want to have those beads tight directly on the nipple you need to have just a little, a little tiny, tiny bit of extra room yep so that'd be my answer is like maybe just a smidgen longer bar if the bar is too tight during that time yeah because it doesn't take much just the bead rubbing up against it just starts making it feel raw yep yep <laughs> no fun um we've got one from uh or uh a comment from the motocross graveyard i, th- I think in response to the tattoo he said five hours on his knee Try that out. It's fun. And man, you are glutton for punishment. I will pass uh, on that. It's not fun, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I I got my knee done too. And I think I had about four hours on mine. I, like, I looked down and it looked like I was looking at a basketball. That thing was just swollen but, and just done. I was like, I don't know how to really get my pants back on here. Yeah, um, I have I have like a permanently dislocated or maybe not dislocated, but it's not in the right spot, patella, like kneecap. Mm -hmm. So that literally sounds, that sounds like one of the worst possible things that I could think of. I, I, when I, when I inevitably get my knee done, I'm, I don't even care what it is. It just has to be fast. (laughs) Yeah. It's just, uh, it just swells up so much compared to a lot of the others, you know, certain spots of the body just swell up like, like the ditch of the arm here behind the knee and they they just puff up and like the knee just turns into a giant basketball. Yep. Yeah, it's a rough time. <laughs> it, it, for me anyways, but yeah, that's no fun. Five hours. Oof. Ugh. Yeah, brutal. Uh, from Anand, uh, I've seen someone mention uh, bowing or bending a surface bar for an anti-eyebrow. Uh, do you know anything about this? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Um, surface piercings, in essence, we're trying to look for the flattest possible area and an area that's not going to be moving around too much. Um, like the back of the neck is a nape, and a lot of times we can find a flat enough. The bar is completely flat with little 90-degree uplifts on there, and that's the part that comes through the skin. But if you're doing this on a rounded area and you're putting a straight bar in there, that's going to force those little 90-degree uplifts to be closer to the skin and kind of pop out quite a bit. So a lot of times when I'm using... Okay, now the other thing I didn't mention here is the surface bars we're talking about are generally flat bars with round part that comes through. So the flat, can you pull up flat surface bar? I I don't know how to describe this. Sure. You'll be able to see surface bar versus flat surface bar. And with the flat surface bar, we can throw just the smallest amount of curve to follow the curvature of your face or your neck or wherever we're doing this. And therefore it's going to allow those gems to sit in flatter. If you put in completely straight on a straight area, you see how like, yeah, those are yeah, the ones you just pointed to right now are flat. Those are Amazon ones, but they're flat across the middle. And go to the one just to the right of it. You see where it says fifth Q, go up one. That one, that's round all the way around. A lot of times when I'm doing a nape piercing, we're using bars like this. And when I'm using a 16-gauge surface bar for like an anti-eyebrow, I want to use the flat so the bar doesn't stick through. Even when I do napes and I use the round bar, that round bar does not stick through, but it typically is a little bit more comfortable. But... With the surface bar, it sits pretty, Sorry about pretty that. flat. Uh, where did we go? Yeah. There we go. Cool. Yeah. So. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, let's see. We've got a question from Gavin. Uh, Scott, I'm looking to get my librette pierced. Uh, question is, does this cause gum erosion on everyone? On which piercing? Uh, librette. Just no, it, center lip. It, it's all about the placement. We were talking about this earlier. If you're too far low and it's straight in and it's rubbing up against your gums, you're going to get gum erosion. Now, the way I do this piercing is I angle it up a little bit, and I only go about a millimeter or so below the lip line, and with it angled up, it more hits the teeth than the gums. And the thing is, is once you downsize, it brings the disc in flat against the lip, and it pulls it away from the teeth a little bit more and creates that little nesting where it goes into your lip a little tiny bit. So I don't pierce straight in. It's a slight angle up. And I don't go too low on the lip. Now, low breaths, when you go that far down, there's a real high risk of the gum erosion. And that's why um, 
Who's the lady that invented uh, the uh, the fishtail libret again? You just post. Do you do you know Nova? You just posted something on your social media the other day. Oh yeah, um, so, let not, me, not I, Michaela. Yeah, I, I'm blanking. Anyways, um, a fishtail is basically like a nostril L, but it follows the curve of the inside, so it doesn't cause the gum erosion the same way. But typically, you don't want to go that low. There's always that risk. If you go too low, that'll actually cause that kind of a problem. So, but yeah, um, yeah, Nova made a social media post the other day talking about well, there's a Michaela Gray was on there, and I don't remember what you're posting about. Oh yeah, it's uh, uh, Raylan Galena. Raylan Galena, that's right. Yep. yep, she's the inventor of the fishtail. And back in the '90s, we used those things all day long, way more so than librettes, because everyone wanted it super low on their lip, and the disc was causing problems. So it was a better alternative. Awesome. Um, Man, let's see. <laughs> yeah, you have some empathizers in the uh, other other fellow mustache people. <laughs> it's frustrating when that happens. Yes, it is. Makes you want to shave it off, then you go, what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think I could ever lose the mustache. I, like, I, the mustache is, to me, more important than the beard. Yeah? Yeah, I think so. I was uh, thinking about getting some, like, I call it mustache riders. You get into, like, little high, high Monroes where they're oh, just above. Sick. It looks so cool. I used to have them before. I don't think I have enough piercings in this area, so I should. It's true. Do you have any oral piercings? I took them all out one day. I was yeah. sick of them. Yeah, I one day it. I was just like, I don't remember why I took them out. I th Oh, yes, I do. Basically, what was happening is I had this group of hearing impaired women come in. Because right next to St. Sabrina's was a school for visually impaired and hearing impaired people. And so all, like four or five groups, the four or five women came in and the one who was completely deaf was the lip reader. And at the time, I think I had seven lip piercings. Now like my Monroe's, normal lips, low breaths, and a tongue or two tongue piercings. So when I spoke, my mouth moved in a really weird manner and she was trying to lip read and she couldn't understand a word I said. And after I was done with the piercing, I'm like, this is it. This is so stupid. I'm obviously, this is impeding life. So I took all my piercings out and they were all steel. And once I was holding all that weight in my hand, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe that was this. And I was like, I can move my, my mouth, mouth again. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm done with this. And I threw it and I haven't had any tongue pier or oral piercings ever since. There you go. I, I had a lot. Way too much, and then I just I think I'm done. So that's awesome. Maybe someday again, but yeah. Oh yeah, motocross uh, said that he's got a double a double zero gauge in his librette. Awesome, right now. That's awesome. awesome. Got a big old lip plate. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, from silently Can judging you, you. Up there. Oh, Can we... oh yeah, sure. Ah, uh... uh, you can't quite see it. Just can't quite see it. Yeah, I have a oh, big clay go. lip. Yeah, there it is. You can see it. It's a big clay lip plate from Ethiopia. I think it's. Five and a half inches. That's awesome. Yeah, super, super rad. Uh, from silently judging, uh, what even holds a nose bone in? It sounds like lost jewelry waiting to happen. You're, you yes are wrong. and no, because either very few times do they come in and out without any problems. Either they fall out all the time and they have to constantly buy new stuff to put it in, or they put it in and it completely seals. And when they come to us, we have to take like a, a, a pliers basically or, you know, cutters, side clips, and cut the top off so we can actually pull it through because the ball is so big. Like they put it in when it's bigger and then everything shrinks up to that size. Yep. A lot of nose bones, like typical body jewelry can be as small as like 20 gauge, maybe going up to an 18 gauge for nostrils. But I've seen those nose bones go down to like probably 22 or 24 gauge. So it's just wow. thin, thin wire with a giant bead. So they got pierced normally. They were able to fit that bead through there. And then it completely closed up on it. And worst case scenario, which I've seen a lot too, is the bone is too short. So they put it in and the skin closes up and seals around it. So they lost the piercing. It's only half in, but it's still locked into their nose and it has to be ripped out at that point. It's terrible. Yeah. It's I bad time. hate nose bones. Yes, indeed. Yep. Me too. Unless it's through the septum, you're wearing a bone through the nose. <laughs> that's different. Yeah, that's, that's a different, different different kind of nose yeah, bone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that uh, that one right behind Scott. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, those aren't bones. Those are actually shells. So. Oh, oh, they are. I shell thought, is I kind th of a bone. That's the exoskeleton. No, I thought it was. was I thought it was tusk. My bad. Yeah, no, that's uh, abalone shells. I believe. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So. Um. Cool. Uh. From Tate. Welcome. Uh. I'm sorry. Not welcome. Welcome, Tate. Uh, <laughs> not welcome. <laughs> 
No, I, you're welcome. No my, matter what Nova says, you're welcome here, dude. My mouth is not working uh, <laughs> along with my, my brain and eyesight today. I'm having a bad mustache day. Sometimes <laughs> it happens, man. It's true. Uh, Tate Felton, morning from Australia. Uh, good morning to you. Nova and Scott. Uh, I asked or is it about, good evening to you? Because it's kind of morning-ish to us. It depends on. Well, it's, it's like 2 p.m. here, so I think we're. There. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, I asked about a six-gauge septum a while ago. Uh, yes. Once the piercing is healed, is it okay to wear silicone tunnels permanently, or are they, or are they only meant for temporary use? No, no. Silicone plugs can work just fine. I'm going to suggest you use the normal silicone, not the um, the skin ones. The skin ones are way thinner, and the thing is, is... Uh, the piercing, like it's going to collapse on that silicone plug. So you need something thick enough wall to keep the hole open at that size. I will say this, getting the plug in sometimes was a little raw because the flare on those silicone plugs are kind of big. Um, it was comfortable when I was wearing it, but getting it out was just like a pop. And I'm like, oh, that hurt, you know? So it does do a little bit of damage. We're just talking about nose bones, how that's a bad idea. And here I'm like, yeah, you go good. It hurts. But, um, so find the right one. Make sure it doesn't have too much of a flare on you. And uh, the bigger you stretch, the easier it is to wear those silicone ones. So awesome. Yeah, we've got about five minutes left technically. Um, so I'm gonna Dang. try to I'm gonna try and scoot scoot us through. That went so quick. Um, yeah, it did. Uh, let's see from Tuna. Uh, why is my piercing so tight? Can't get it open without the help of pliers. Um, I assume you mean ringless. Captain bead ring, threaded, there's a lot. Um, the thing is, is like if you have a barbell and there's threadings on there, um, the longer you have it, like shampoo, soaps, conditioners, oils from your skin create a seal and lock it into place. Um, if it's a captive bead ring, it's pinching on, a, like a ring with pinching on a bead. Sometimes it's just on there so tight it's hard. You just got to get out with pressure. And if it's a threadless one, we put a small bend in on that pin. And if that bend is way more intense, sometimes they're really hard to get undone because they're adjustable. You get it super tight or you get it super loose and it just might be super, super tight. Yeah. Awesome. You might need to see a piercer if you can't get it. It's true. We got the tools for it. Uh, from GNVR again, uh, planning to get my septum re-pierced and my tongue. What's something that can help me with the healing of the tongue? Um, the second time around is definitely a lot easier than the first time because your body has a little bit of a memory and it won't swell as much. But again, um, eat a nice big meal before you go in. Uh, try to keep the swelling down as much as you can during the next couple days after you get it pierced. Ibuprofen, Aleve, or Advil. Um, and uh, downsizing after maybe a couple of weeks. But the second time around is definitely a lot easier than that first time. Agreed. Yep. Um, this is a comment. Uh, it says that there's no better material for irritated stretch lobes, in my opinion, than wood, uh, specifically in some smaller size just to let them calm down. Uh, and when they're healed, go bigger again. Wood is very smooth and doesn't cause problems like metal. I'm not sure I would agree with that. I halfway agree with them. Okay. okay. I, when I had my, my, my earlobes, um, I would wear wood all the time. And when they were irritated, I would leave it in there and they were comfortable. But when you're irritated, your, your body's creating more fluids and seepage out of there. And I found that my wood plugs would stick to my ears a lot more, even though they're fairly smooth, they can stick. And if you end up turning them when they're dry, you rip and tear that fistula to with scar tissue, which causes a lot more problems. So if you're wearing plugs, um, and it's, you're, and they're nice and smooth. And if you can't move them, you have to do it in the shower, the hot water and slowly manipulate them until they break free. Um, in my opinion though, whenever I'm having a problem with a piercing, I go to titanium plugs or glass plugs because they're yep. a lot easier to clean, the less chance of crusties and things sticking to them. I don't know what it was about the wood plugs, though. Maybe it's because they're more absor absorbing of the moisture compared to glass and a metal, so the moisture didn't stick around and they dried out, therefore healing a little bit better. Um, but you're right. There's something to it, but it sticks, and that's the part that can cause a different type of problem. So you got to be careful. Awesome. Yes. It's a good point. I'm surprised you brought that up. I mean, most people don't wear the wood plugs, and and I did notice that back in the day too. But it's the sticking, so yeah. Yep, for sure. Cool. Um, Great point. Let's see. Oh, uh, <laughs> this is a question from Motocross Graveyard. Uh, Motocross. What's Scott's daily routine that makes him so positive and humble? And somebody responded and said, "Cake?" Question mark. There we go. Yeah, more cake. Um. <laughs> Positive and humble. Uh, it's just 
it's in my blood. It's all I know is piercing. So it's just so easy for me to talk about. And, um, it's my passion. So I bet if whatever your passion is, we were sitting talking about it, you're going to chip her up a little bit too. Now, if you want to talk to me about like uh, cars and like what's wrong with my car, I'm not going to be as happy. <laughs> so, so that's true. pretty much what it is. It's like find some passion, things you love, and uh, it's a lot easier to be happy and uh, happier in life. I'm pretty lucky that my whole life revolves around piercing. I can be as involved in with it as much as I am, and it keeps me happy. Not everyone finds something they're happy with, and they can do it day in and day out. So, how are we doing there, Nova? Awesome. I think we've got time for one last question. So one I'm last take... question. This is a pretty long one uh, from Oaken Cloaken. Um, hello again. Greetings, Scott and Nova. I apologize if this message is long. I promise my next question won't be so long, but here goes. Uh, I wanted to explain what's wrong with my earlobe piercings. It's not a blowout or anything major. Uh, I just have, I have one piercing that has a small slit from an accident that I had. Um, I've been using and massaging Mederma scar gel daily, uh, and I don't like the way it looks. That's why I want to get the upper part of the slit fixed before going in and getting re-pierced eventually. Uh, would it be more worth waiting to get it fixed first and then re-pierced? Or if I got it re-pierced first, it, would it make them, uh, if I got them pierced first, wouldn't that make them look more noticeable? And what would you do in that situation? So I think the idea is that there is a slit there. Like a um, cheese cutter slit, like war heavy. Uh, it's, it, I, I, it said from an accident. So I, I imagine, okay. um, may, maybe, maybe not jewelry related, but, yep. uh, still like an injury to the earlobe. Um, so should they get it? Like, I, I think I understand what first, you're um, so, yeah. like, it's not like your ears deformed. You just have the scar on the front from the slit or whatever. Um, I'm assuming it didn't cut all the way through is what it sounds like. It sounds like it's just a scar. And then, yeah, the Mederma is going to be your best bet to getting rid of any discoloration and harder tissue. Um, without the Mederma, even if you just had a big scar going across your ear, you still can technically get it pierced and heal it up. It just, the scar tissue generally won't go away. We don't ever want to use Mederma or some sort of scar tissue remover where there's piercings or healed piercings because it's going to, you've healed that fistula and that eats the fistula away, kind of leaving it raw or really, really thinning it out and your piercing is going to really, really act up. So the Mederma is great for getting rid of the scar tissue. And then once you're okay with the way your ear looks, you're totally fine to get it pierced. Nova, does that sound like I answered that properly is to the yeah. question? Yeah. I think so. Cool. I hope that it, I hope that it works for you. Um, if it doesn't answer your question properly, we're gonna probably be on next week and I'm definitely gonna have Kelsey here Absolutely. and we can discuss it more. So now this is where we wind up our show. I hope you guys all had a really good time here today. I hope you learned something. And remember, hit the like, hit the subscribe, and of course, keep putting holes your body. We'll see you all in the next video.